The F and Rad Snowboard Podcast is presented by Vans. Season 8 of F and Rad is sponsored by Wired Snowboards, Anon Optics, The Boardroom Snowboard Shop, Find an Epic Agent Worldwide Real Estate, and Tribute Board Shop in Nelson, BC. Wired Snowboards is a Vancouver based manufacturer and distributor of quality hand built snowboards. One of their latest projects was building a board for the Vancouver Canucks. If you haven't seen it, check out Wired's Instagram. There are some rad shots of the board and Wired team rider and honorary Canuck Devin Walsh ripping it on Seymour. That was a fun session. I want to thank Brad Hepner for getting me out to that. Go to wiredsnowboards.com and design your own custom one-of-a-kind snowboard or choose from their many in-stock shapes. You'll be stoked. Support also comes from Dekine, Mount Seymour, Grouse Mountain, Pro Standard GoPro Accessories, and Volcom Outerwear. Listeners, if you could manage a little liking and following, maybe ask a friend or two to do it as well and subscribe to the YouTube channel. That would help people find the show. Special thanks this episode to Beneath Apparel, Kaya J and the Drink Ticket's new album, Better, and Tomahawk Indigenous Products. Travis Wood was a pro snowboarder on the Joyride team before crossing over to the company side of the equation with Forum. Travis was the marketing guy at Foursquare Distribution during the absolute heyday, as you'll hear. And as an industry staple, he went on to work for Sims before starting his own distribution company. These days, Travis spends a lot of time raising his son and hunting in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains where he lives and where we recorded this interview. When I was at Forum, we were spending an ungodly amount of money on marketing and riders and all that different stuff that weren't, yeah. you know, relative to our sales. You know, there's a reason why it sold to Burton for debt and a dollar or whatever the rumor was. Oh, wow. Um, but when I went to Sims, you know, there was a... $35 million business. Um, and I watched it basically go bankrupt, <laughs> get sold to Jamie Salter that was at Gen X. Yep. Oh, yeah. Who right. sold Gen X to Huffy that was a half a billion dollar business. Right. That went bankrupt. Unbelievable. So, you know, um, I didn't learn a lot necessarily at Forum business wise because by all intents and purposes, we were doing everything right. Okay. So let's, let's dig into this forum thing for a bit. Cause I have right. a theory. Well, but my point to yeah, follow that yeah, up is when yes. I went to Sims and yeah. it failed, yeah. I learned more in failure and yes. I know it's cliche, but I learned more watching this 30 billion, 30 million dollar business fall apart yes. than I ever did in watching form go from 5 million to 35 million. Got you. You know, that makes total sense. Right. Yeah. My theory is that there hasn't ever been a snowboard company or there wasn't a snowboard company in the 90s and 2000s that could afford the marketing budgets that they were doing. Like if they were to be business savvy, sorry, not to afford the budgets, to afford a million dollar rider. Like there was never anyone that could could pay a million dollar rider and actually have the revenue of the board sales. Think of how many boards you got to sell of that guy's board in well, order to make it that that number. You know, relative, I can't remember what the metrics were, but let's say marketing should have been eight to 10% of your total sales. Right. Okay. Right. And if you're doing, let's say, $100 million in sales, yeah. And you're spending eight to $10 million yeah. in marketing, yeah. And you've got eight solid <laughs> freaking riders, yeah, you yeah. start, the money starts to go away. And then you think about the margins on snowboards. You know, on a good day, if they're 50%, you're still giving discounts to people and paying early and you're waiting for people to pay. You've got to have, like, you know, when at Four Star and Forum, we started Circa, you've got to have a year-round business. Otherwise, you're dead in the water. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know how a lot of companies survived then. And they didn't, really. They didn't. I mean, none if you think about did. it, they didn't. None of them did. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, none of them did. Yeah. I think Burton being, you know, they, they had such a big market share and they had... They they had their fingers in all sorts of different, you know. They tried like Gravis shoes. They but they diversified into like red helmets and kept that kind of separate for a bit. They made good marketing decisions. It felt like, and and have stayed solvent the whole time. But I think also Jake and Donna 
Okay. I, I don't know the, you know, the capital requirements that they had. Right. I know, I don't know the whole story, but I know they had some money behind the Carpenter name and stuff like that. Um, or the Burton name, I should say. And, and, yeah. you know, just understanding the way that business works. I mean, look at Nike got into the snowboard business. And, and they got out and, and, and many out. times, right? <laughs> yeah, and so yeah, yeah, yeah. we're talking about a multi-billion dollar company, one of the mo- most well-known brands in the world. And they got out of it. What do you think that says? Like, what's your what's your guess on that? Oh, I think then I probably had one, you know, theory about it. Today, I think um, snowboarding barrier to entry is it's expensive. Mm-hmm. I mean, I haven't been up and paid for a ticket for a while, but the last time I did, I think it went to Squaw Valley before it changed over to Palisades and it was 185 bucks. I paid 210 yesterday. Just a freaking ride. 210. They had, they had like three out of their chair lifts. There's obviously a reason they're getting that money. There's obviously a reason they're charging that money. I'm sure it's expensive to operate, but I got to think from a soft goods, hard goods standpoint, at the end of the day, there's just no money in it. Yeah, I think you know? you're right. That for the for the amount of time and energy you're putting into it, and I'm sure there's an algorithm that Nike uses and looks at their core business and their other businesses and says this just ain't worth the money. Yeah, yeah. There's a right. cutoff point. I th- I think I was similar to you, and I'm going to make a guess here. the The thought before was that they just couldn't be number one, in the, so they didn't want to be second or third or fourth. But I th- I think at this point it's like they just looked at the money in it and said, this is such a small market. Right. I mean, they, are they still doing the skateboard thing? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know either. I'm, I'm assuming they do, but they do shoes. Yes. So that makes yes. sense. You know, yes. boots yeah. is a little yeah. bit, it's close, but it ain't, you know, and then imagine trying to do boards or hard goods and snowboarding is such a, you know, from a business standpoint, such a different animal than anything else out there. The closest thing you can compare it to is skiing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But now, I, and I don't even know the brands that are out there. The only one I really kind of pay attention to anymore is Capita because it's blue and blue is an old, you know, homie. Um, yeah. And, but I don't know how they're doing from a business standpoint, looking at the umbrella company that they have, the C3, they've got to have multiple brands to have that, that, um, revenue for the times when it's slow. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like they're doing really well. Last thing in the world I would get involved <laughs> is the snowboard business. <laughs> That and a CBD company. Those are probably two of the last things. Why not CBD? Because I'm already involved in one, and I freaking (laughs) knew I shouldn't have been. (laughs) But all props to Steve Ruff and Just Live. Um, But, you know, uh, where I live, this is uh, uh, heavily uh, influenced by uh, CBD and THC, and I've seen a lot of guys that made a lot of money growing take that money and try to go legal and go into the legal CBD market. And they've all lost their ass. Every single one of them. Yeah. It's a weird thing. I I dabbled with CBD just like personally when it first came in, I'm like, this sounds great. Not getting high, eating a bunch of, you know, getting the benefits. And at first I was like, wow, I have great sleeps, but I already had great sleeps. Right. I'm like, oh, the pain relief is great. And then right. I was like, is it though? I don't know. And then I heard a big uh, podcast about like technically CBD, if you ingest it, right. your liver process is like 80% of it. So you're only getting 20%. a little bit of the right. of the dose, whereas topically it's actually pretty good. You know, I know, and I know there's, you know, there's new science behind CBZ and all the different oh, things. Wow. I know they're, they're, they're breaking it down to where they're getting it a little more refined. Um, you know, we've with, for just live, um, I'm an investor in that company. They pivoted from just CBD to more of a sports and wellness and that's starting to take off. Yeah. But my point was, is, you know, there's some things that are <laughs> things I wouldn't invest in anymore. No, no offense to, uh, the investment that I have, but. <laughs> For the money people in my life, the excitement of finding the new thing when it's like what you were talking about with a stock. So if yeah. there's a 50 cent stock yeah. that's going to go to a hundred dollars yeah. that you could do one transaction and right. basically set yourself up to retire. My rule of thumb when I'm investing and it's, it's changed, uh, over the years, but I used to have this rule if I 30% of my investments hit. If I invest in 10 things and three of them hit, typically those three have paid out. 10 times more than what I've lost, gotcha, you know? Gotcha. Um, but, um, there's a guy, Dan Pena that I uh, follow. He's an old school, extroverted, hard nosed <laughs> business guy. And, um, he says, man, the guys that the big boys, when they invest in something, 
they don't diversify. They go freaking all in. And so mm. that's kind of what I've been doing the last couple of years. That's investments yeah. and stuff. Yeah. So you were always the whole way through, you know, like investing. Did you invest in properties and that kind of stuff when you were young or? You know, when I was, um, so I, I started snowboarding back in 90, I nice. think was a year. What was, was the board that you were on? It's a man, you know, the, <laughs> I was, I was thinking about this earlier cause I knew you were coming over and I couldn't even tell you the damn video parts that I was in wow. when I snowboarded because I just, I did, had a different mentality about how I saw snowboarding. I love the snowboard obviously, but what attracted me to it is that it pissed people off <laughs> yeah. cause I was an old punk rock kid back in orange County in the punk rock scene. Sick. Back when No Doubt was an actual punk rock band and yep. not a, a glam band. Yep. And um, I, I grew up in Big Bear Lake, but I moved down to Orange County when I was uh, early in my teens. And then I went back up to Big Bear Lake. And I, so I skied like everybody else that was around at that time. We didn't have snowboarding. And um, all my buddies were snowboarding uh, one time. And we went up night uh, snowboarding. And I don't even remember the board I had. But I want to say it was either a Sims or it might've been a Lamar one or sure, two, some, sure. somebody let me borrow. Yeah. And I was, um, chasing this girl. <laughs> um, and you know, she was cute. I was trying to get after her and she snowboarded. And so I went up and she freaking smoked me, man. <laughs> she was laughing at me. Remember every part of my body was sore, but that's how I got into it. Um, and once I started it, I haven't skied since, right? Um, and no, nothing against skiing, but I just didn't have a, a, a reason to do it. And I got into it because, you know, when I went into the the line at the ski lift to get on, the skiers hated hated me. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I grew up skiing. I was like, what the fuck is this guy's problems? But um, when I moved down to Orange County, I got into surfing and skateboarding and stuff like that. And I just loved how much it pissed the establishment off. Totally. And that was always my draw to snowboarding was more of the a community of, of, you know, kids saying, fuck the norm. Totally. You know? Totally. Yeah. It's not there anymore. And it's, it's right. shocking. I, I mean, it's there in some pockets, right? you know, but it's, you know, I took the intern for the show to bamp for like crushes holy bully event right. oh fuck it was so cool yeah but on the way out there we drove by cop calgary olympic park right. and there was a big half pipe and it was in the sun it was perfectly groomed right and i was like pull over man he's yeah. like why i'm like because we're gonna go ride that half You're pipe. pirate he's it. like no i don't want to trespass that's weird why are you trespassing yeah. i said listen kid if there's a half pipe in some snow and there's snowboarders right. going by. The snowboarders get to ride that. That's right. just the way that it is. It's, well, what's the worst that's going to happen? They're going to kick you out. Right, right. Yeah. So then at the end, as we're driving out, he's like, that was the best day of my life. That was <laughs> most fun snowboarding I've ever had. But yeah, if you, if you contrast what we were going through, which was massive um, product like innovation. So yeah. that's fun. Right. People hate on you. Oh, yeah. So that's fun. Right. And so, yeah, because if they're already hating on you, and then you have a little bonfire in the parking lot. You're smoking cigarettes and drinking beers. And they come over. They go, what the fuck are you guys doing? You know, yeah, we're doing what we're doing. I just, you know, again, growing up as a punk rock kid, you're wearing Doc Martens and having uh, mohawks and, yeah. you know, flight jackets and, and dickies or, you know, sure. bondage pants and stuff like that. So you already yeah. look different. Yep. So I was used to, uh, you know, people kind of staring at me. And then snowboarding was just an extension of that. And, you know, you had guys like Rochi and, and Palm. And it's interesting because, you know, they're like a, a generation before me, but we're yes. not that far off in age. Right. Right. Which right. is weird because yeah. yeah. we're only a couple years older, but it was a different generation, if you will. Totally. But those guys to me were like, fuck yeah, these guys are fucking punk rock. That's what it's all about. And obviously it's changed over the years and you had the hip hop and all the different influences. But in the mm -hmm. beginning, at least in my mind, it was... Just an extension of being punk rock. Yeah, I think I think there was a beginning before the beginning where it was just like kind of weird California surf vibe or right. like it didn't really have a vibe. You had all these little pockets all over the place in Utah and BC right. and California where people were just building boards out of plywood right. and then riding in the passes. Well, you know, you had like, you know, Damien's generation, Sanders and yeah. Farm and all those guys and you know, everything kind of came from skiing because that's the only thing that anybody was doing on snow except right. for tobogganing, you know? Yeah. And, and then you had, you know, kids like, you know, Noah and, and, and AV and all those guys in Tahoe that were taking that, 
that um, skate style and the skate attire, if yeah. you will, yeah, and and transforming it or, or bringing it to the snow, and that was the part that like. Like the Damon Dayglow was like, <laughs> I mean, we all did it as skiers because that's all we freaking yeah, had. Yeah, but yeah, 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 yeah. once, you know, the, the skate influence started happening again, I mean, I, I loved snowboarding, but I was never a great snowboarder. The, by the time I would learn a trick, it was already outdated. <laughs> you know, my, my snowboard career started after the, the rail craze kind of ended. Yep. And yep. my snowboard career ended when the rail craze started up again. I got you. And I got so freaking broke off on rails, it was like, I'm not a good snowboarder. I know exactly that. But area. I love the culture. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you you mentioned the skate style coming in. It was like the very first skate style was, yeah, probably like Salaz and those guys. Yeah. And Hetzel. They were vert skaters. For sure. And, and, and Dale and, and Nate but and all those guys. Yeah, that was sure. when it really just exploded. Yeah. That was, was where it was yeah, going. Yeah. It was like know? Dale and Nate and the Joyride team that we were yeah. talking about before. And Donahue, Adam Merriman. Right? And, and, the, oh, yeah. and all the guys up in uh Rest Colorado. in peace, Adam. Rest yeah, in peace. Yeah, man. Yeah. So it was... It was kind of inevitable. I think you're right. Like the freestyle thing happened. It's crazy how close the stuff is. Like you say, your generation was close to, you know, the Damien generation. Well, in skateboarding, there was like 70s skateboarding. Right. That kind of morphed into 80s skateboarding, right. early 80s. And that's snowboarding had that too. There was 70s snowboarding yeah. and it kind of morphed into 80s snowboarding at the same time. Right. Well, yeah. and you know, you, you, you had guys like Tom and and Jake that were like, you know, Terry and the early guys, Craig, you know. Yeah. And you think about like even Craig and 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 um Terry and these guys weren't that much when you talk about generation, I think of like, you know, Gen Z yes. or Gen X and all that. We're talking five, ten, fifteen years. Parents, grandparents. Right. And yeah, now yeah, in yeah, snowboarding, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're talking like you know, senior in high school is <laughs> yeah. one generation and yeah, a freshman yeah. is a whole other yeah. generation. Yeah. And so um, within that, there were so many different styles and uh, different uh, um, progressions of just those errors alone. You know, who were your guys? Like what, what were the movies that you were watching? The guys that you were like, <sighs> emulating? Dude, it's, <laughs> <laughs> if I ever get asked about movies and I just, <laughs> you know, I, I just remember fall on films had some, some stuff that I like to watch standard obviously. And, and Mac dog. Yeah. And then there was some independence, you know, that I had filmed with. Um, I remember Marcus Polson did a movie and, but I couldn't tell you what it was, but Rad. you know, there was the three main guys, um, and I had a good friend in high school, Brian Thien, who was a professional snowboarder. Hell yeah. And Brian was one of those freaks that like was just good at everything. And, you know, the kid in, in high school was like, I think he graduated, he was like 5'8 and 130 pounds. <laughs> yeah. And for some reason out of high school, he had a growth spurt and he was like 6'1 and, you know, 180. Oh, I didn't and know And he was one of those super tall guys like Donahue that had yeah. just amazing style for how tall he was. Rad. And, um, you know, I, he was one of the first guys I snowboarded with and with, along with a couple other guys and watching him do it. And he was a really good skateboarder and surfer and he was just so smooth. And so I kind of just hung out with him yeah. and followed him around. And I didn't know anything about the actual scene of snowboarding. Right. I was just hanging out with my buddy, Brian snowboarding and Brian started filming with fall line films. And I think he was like, Roadkill, he was in Roadkill, so I remember that one. Yeah, he was. And I That's remember right. Up in the Ante with yep. Mac Dog. Yep. And all of a sudden, like our little shop that we went to to skateboard and snowboard started helping him get sponsors. And he was just all of a sudden traveling and in these videos. And I had no freaking idea what that was all about. That's so sick. So he got me into um, snowboarding the scene part just by hanging out with him and watching what was going on. And I had some some events in my life where you get that fork in the road and you're either going to fucking die yeah, by, if you keep making the same choices or you're going to do something else. And, uh, I had, uh, one of those moments where I was in some deep shit and I had some people that were looking for me and I needed to get out of town. And this was before social media right. and phone. So yeah. it wasn't easy to find people. Yeah. You can and, just move a town. Over. Right. And Brian <laughs> called me um and he was living up in big bear and he was like dude you should get out of town and um come up to big bear and snowboard and he's like you're a good snowboarder like you might get sponsored or something rad so i said shit that sounds better than fucking getting killed <laughs> <laughs> and so um that's how i got into it and and i knew enough about business from my dad to see trends and see how things were going yeah. that i could pick pick up on you know what i needed to do to 
be a part of of the scene, if you will. That's rad. So you do probably what three, four years as a pro, maybe more. I don't, I don't know. That's a good question. I um, did it pay the bills? Like, were you at a po- at some point just like riding for your living? So full disclosure, like when I was in teenager in high school and in college, I was selling weed. Okay, and um. You know, I would go and buy a couple pounds and break it up into eights. Yeah. And I would make a couple grand a week. <laughs> like, you know, back then that was yeah. good money. Yeah, yeah. Um, and one of the guys that I um sold for, if you will, I'd get it fronted to me. Um, it was kind of like in a little umbrella network. Well yeah. Yeah. um I got rolled. Somebody had rolled me. Oh, no and, way. And the cop showed up at the door and you know, you're gonna go to prison forever if you don't give us the names of people that you're working for and yeah. Um, that was scary. That's fucking that was a scary crazy. situation. Yeah, and and um, and you're a kid. I was eighteen, and oh, wow. um, they had my little black book, so they could see the names of oh, the people, no. and so they had a couple guys' names in there with their Polaroid pictures on the wall, and they say, "We know this guy, and we know this guy, and we know you're working for him," mm. and almost got me to roll. Oh, wow. Yeah, they got me scared. And I know everybody talks, I'd never roll them, blah, blah, blah. When you're sitting there in fucking jail and you're sitting around guys that are fucking tatted up and you're 18 years old and you're the little skinny white boy in there, it's scary. Um, but I didn't roll. Um, what ended up happening is there was three guys that I was involved with. Two of them ended up dead. Oh, my God. One of them ended up with three holes in his chest. Holy and the other shit. one was found at a stoplight in Anaheim with his head blown off. Jesus. And he had a bunch of money and weed right next to him. Somebody just executed him. And that's when I decided I needed to get the Yeah, no out. shit. Right. And yeah. so they ended up, years later, the guy uh, ended up getting busted. He had both those guys executed so they wouldn't rat him off. Oh, my God. And he knew me. And so that's where I was like, you know. Yeah, that's scary as fuck. Right. And so my point to that is is that so he ended up getting busted. He was smuggling drugs with HA um through um Harley Davidson parts from the East Coast to the West Coast. They were oh, putting wow. cocaine and, and meth, shipping them back and forth, and he ended up getting busted and they took down fifty four people, including D A's D E A agents. And a whole list of his family members that had uh, business, fronted businesses. So the point was, so I, I went up to Big Barrier to get the hell away from that. Yeah. And then by default, um, I got sponsored. And I don't remember exactly how it happened other than, you know, I had a, a shop I was riding for, Hot Skates. Nice. And down in Orange County. And it was a skateboard shop. This guy, Rudy, owned it. And um, he had some connections. And somehow... Um, you know, Steve Graham grew up in the same town that we did Orangeville Park. So Steve was like the man, the man. And, um, Steve floated aboard to the shop and let me ride a Lamar. And so I rode that for a little while. And then GT, Greg Tomlinson, props to Greg. Um, he was a uh, Von Zipper, but he was a moral rep at the time. And then he started floating me boards and shit. I just started riding and charging and doing yeah, my thing yeah, yeah yeah and i wasn't really paying attention to like you know what i should be doing who i should be doing it for i was just doing it and uh eventually um mark hibden and uh, matt donahue and dan paterka skateboarder dan um who were part of movement they were starting this company called movement and i was up just riding i think i was riding at that time J, G, uh, gt went to ride and floated me a ride board right. i was riding an old i think i was riding the dales no i think i was riding what russell's board yeah and it was a short ass board it's like a 146 it's and i'm 6 one you know yeah, <laughs> and i'm just tossing off big moguls and and, yeah. and 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 um bumps and and anyways the movement guys were like hey you want to ride for us and i'd gotten product before but i didn't know uh, what to ride for what does that mean exactly yeah but yeah, movement brought me in, paid me a little bit of money, and uh, gave me a travel budget. From there, um, I ended up getting picked up by Joyride, and Joyride was where I made money. And, yeah. You know, not not a lot of money, but my point to the, telling you that story is I had weed money, right? That I had stashed away, and while I was going to college, um, I was working at a mortgage company and snowboarding. Jeez. So I stashed that away. And yeah. so I was <laughs> oh, living man. off unemployment, weed money, <laughs> right? And money I had in the bank. Yeah. And Jared was like, you know, 
we'll pay you X amount of dollars. I don't remember what it was. And travel budget. Damn. And I was like, cool. Yeah. And I was like, well, how does the travel budget thing work? And they said, you just, you know, travel or you get certain budget and we'll reimburse you. Unbelievable. And I said, well, fuck all that. Just give me the travel budget and the salary. <laughs> Cause I understood enough that I could write it off and so could they. Right. Right. Just give me the money and I'll travel. Yeah. And you can just write it off. You don't have to me to submit expenses. Yeah. So I think the most I ever made was like 30 grand, but we're talking 94, 95. That's like you could, you could more, you get a mortgage for a fairly good home with a 30,000. It wasn't like I was making point. in the weed game or the, or, <laughs> you know, the mortgage business, but yeah, yeah, dude, I was living with my friends in the mountains. I was going to Mount hood in the summertime coaching. And then I was coming back and surfing in San Clemente until winter came around. Like, uh, somebody's that, paying me to yeah, do that. That's unfreaking. Yeah, I got lucky. I, I, I didn't deserve to yeah. get paid, but um, no, you did. You, no, you did, I, you know, I, I, I was a shitty snowboarder. Um, <laughs> but I was back then. You could, you could have a personality. Personalities mattered, and you can market it. And it was going from that, you know, writing in the magazine sponsorship ads images to. I remember Rowan like sitting on a on a chair on the beach. And Brian Thien, like golfing on a, <laughs> on a pool table with, you know, I'm seeing for special plan. And it was like, that was where it was going. It was like, I just had to be a good personality and get a couple shots in the magazines and videos. And I did that great. Yeah. And then Peter yeah. Lyons started flipping upside down and my freaking career was done. Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> I remember that very, very well. That time where, you know, if you could do a nice shifty back 180, <laughs> you were ready to, you were ready to get a sponsorship. And then, and then, yeah, I can grab mute, man. I can yeah. grab mute. I can spin 360s. And then all of a sudden it was upside down and, right. and backwards, a lot of backwards stuff. And, and it really just separated the wheat from the chaff is what it was. And it, it should have been. Yeah. It should have been. Yeah. Well, there was a lot more money and it was like skateboarding had made us feel like the sponsorship route was the way to go. Right. I, I met a guy on the Donner chairlift and his, his, his stickers on his helmet and stuff were still not sponsored. Right. And he is like that punk attitude you right. were talking about, like from back in the day, he was like, fuck being sponsored. Me and my friends were like, nah, we aren't going for sponsorship. Right. I was like, Oh dude, I was the opposite of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I mean, if, if, you know, being a, a, a snowboarder was kind of like, being a vagabond yes. that, that got unemployment, you know? And, <laughs> yeah. and I like the idea of, you know, I know this, when I left form and went to Sims, I got really clear on who my friends were because mm -hmm. I wasn't at the cool company anymore. And I was trying to rebuild a company. Mm -hmm. And then when I left Sims and got out of snowboarding, I got even more clear about who my mm -hmm. friends were. Mm -hmm. But what I really got clear on was when I went snowboarding with my friends, that was what it was all about. Yeah. That was the feeling. That yeah. was what it yeah. was really ever all about. Being punk rock and this feeling of snowboarding. But when I was in the in the scene, it was about how do I get to the next fucking day yeah. and snowboard. Yep. And we all know the top ramen with the egg and the macaroni with the hot dogs and all the shit that you eat just to get by. Yeah. And the beer with the white can and the blue label that just says <laughs> beer. Like we all did that shit. And so, you know, it, in hindsight, I should have never been sponsored. But I definitely appreciated what the sponsors did for me. And I totally get like why Roan, for example, would say, fuck this and check out and just ride to ride. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and I think any path that you do it, that you can ride and enjoy it is great. I'll tell you this. I never had more fun snowboarding than when I wasn't sponsored. Right. Because there's no pressure. You don't have to do it on anybody else's um, um, time. There's no responsibilities. And you're just free to express, you know? Yeah, yeah. I see that a lot with the guests of the show. You know, I was just riding with Blaze yesterday. Right. He's a, he's a great champion of that cause. Of right. like, But then it's kind of weird because now he's back on Corey Smith's uh, spring break. Right. right. And so he's like, let's get some clips. And I'm right. like, he's like, this is a job. I'm like, oh, God. But he's that kind of hustler. He likes the... He likes to be doing things, it seems like. You know, like. there's there's guys like that, too, like Chad Otterstrom and yes. even like Kurt Wastel. And, Hell and yeah. Bobby, I know, still has it. Blue, yeah. Cody, Dresser. Yeah. That, those guys can fucking still snowboard still and hang, pretty yeah. darn good, yeah. especially good for the age group. Yes. And Blaze is one of those guys, too. Um, and if they can get some cheddar from that, making some money from it, more power to them. I'm, yeah. 
my fucking hips are broken. My body's broken. <laughs> like I get up and down the hill to chase an elk, but I'm not, not getting after it. Like, I so you to. went from pro snowboarder to team manager kind of guy, or was that like, you know, I was, um, so after the joyride thing ended, I think I, I, I tore my Achilles tendon. And, um, the cool thing about back in the day, when you got a video part, yeah, that guaranteed you two years of money. <laughs> nice. One year while you're video filming the video part, and yep. then another year for after the video part. And then if you didn't get one after that, a video part, then the gig was up and people knew you were, you know, weren't on your shit. Yep. But, um, you know, uh, so I had a video part in one of Whitey's movies. I can't remember what it was called, but it was nothing special. I think Joyride, you know, sponsored the movie. So yeah, thank you, Whitey, for putting me in all your movies when you didn't have to. <laughs> the contract was up. I knew I was done. I think I was like 26, 27. My body freaking hurt. Um, my buddy Jason Bump, um, who I lived with, and, and Brian Thien, um out in Utah. Um, I knew Jason was taking a job in the industry, and he had been taking some computer classes for design cool. and I knew I had to do something. And, you know, while I was, while I tore my Achilles tendon, I had some time on my hands and Chad Denena, you know, from Nixon that's now at uh, Transworld, got me, um, some kind of, um, you know, foot in the door to be able to write. So I started submitting independently, um, articles to Transworld, but I think Sick. my style was a little abrasive for him. I, I think I submitted some stuff to Pat Bridges at um, Snowboarder, and they gave me some little column that I did. Yep. But then they had Blunt Magazine. Nice. And Blunt was more my style. And, you know, my my kind of aspect or my my uh, pitch was is that, you know, I'm a snowboarder. I know what snowboarders talk about. I know what really fucking goes on. Hell yeah. Besides all this political shit. And so I went and started writing a lot for Blunt. And while I was still snowboarding and I was doing interviews and I tr kind of transitioned out of snowboarding into marketing and media and promotions at Four Star, which at the time Holy was shit. Special Blend, who I rode for, um, yep. Four Square and um, Forum. And um, they needed somebody to handle all the media and, and marketing, not, not marketing in a sense of marketing the products, but marketing the riders. Got it. So you got to imagine this, like. I'm like never really a great pro snowboarder <laughs> tail end of my career. You know, when I first saw JP come off this cornice, 40 foot fucking cliff and do like half cab, uh, 540 and land or I was like, I'm, I'm fucking done. <laughs> and I was watching him and now to be able to be on that team, if you will, totally was pretty cool. You had Peter at the time, JP. I don't think Jeremy was on there yet. And I think we had BJ and, and uh, Bjorn and, and uh, Chris Duffesey. Then you had Mac Dog. That was part of it. Unbelievable. And yeah. it was like, Mac Dog's a god. Yeah. And yes. you had a couple of designers in there that I knew about that were on their shit. Um, Steve Ruff was a, a pro snowboarder um, up in Big Bear and was went from Dragon to work for Farmer. I knew Steve really well. He was my team manager at Dragon. Sick. And so this, it was like, here we go. Here's another opportunity yeah. for me to be into something where I'm not that good, <laughs> but I got this team yeah. of people. Okay, but on this one, I'm calling your bluff because you are that good. You can see what this is. Well, I didn't know that then, though. You have to understand, yeah. like yeah. when I went in there, I sat in a meeting with MacDog. Anybody that sat in me with Mac Dog knows the Mac Dog lazy eye stare. Well, he will fucking stare you down and pick your soul apart. Uh, yeah, yeah. It feels like that. Yeah, yeah. I had it with Peter, which Peter and I were always cool, but you know, Peter could didn't talk much, very introverted, somewhat intimidating, and Rawl, who I knew, yeah. and Ruff, who I knew, and they knew like my punk rock dark side because sure. I was off the the hip and said a lot of shit and didn't play by the rules, especially with Blunt. Yeah. And Mac Dog and Peter had this cleaner image. So it was a little nerve wracking. But I remember sitting in a in a room with them and they're just like kind of breaking me down. Like, what are you going to do and how are you going to do it? And you're going to keep all this blunt shit out of here and not be so, you know, <laughs> crass and blah, blah. And they really like, said that for real? Yeah, I mean, and I understood because, you know, I mean, we were doing stuff with blunt, like with porn stars and, like yeah. you know, yeah. Cody shitting in beanies and, like, <laughs> yeah. you know, product yeah. testing, breaking <laughs> bottles over our heads. Totally. So, you know, they, they had a completely different image. But uh, who was that blunt at that time? Was Andy Bloomberg a part of that? This was uh, right around – it was – there was a couple different guys. I mean, yeah. Tremaine was 
you know, the guy, the main guy, right? Before, after, um, Ken had sold it. Yeah. Um, you had Tremaine, Cliver was there, Dave England was there. Right. I mean, all the jackass guys basically yeah, before yeah. jackass. Were you there when Sean and Sean came down from Canada? Oh, yeah. About the whiskey thing? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Johnson and Kearns are two, two of my favorites. Yeah. Um, but so, and Andy was, I think Andy was brought in there to more like clean up shit. Because it had gone. Yeah, so I think because like, like Carney was like a, like, like an editor or something like that. Dave Carney was yeah. like, it was just. You know, it, it shit. We got everything done. We needed to get done, but it would have been fun. Like that would have been just. It's like at the start of this thing that nowadays, like, what are you going to do now? Like, because well, all the shit that they've done is so gnarly. Now kids are like jumping into cactuses and shit. Yeah, it's compl- yeah, well, yeah, you know, it's, side it's, side note. I was in. Um, I took a acting class in Hollywood because I started to have to speak in front of large crowds. Right. And somehow or another, my acting teacher got me this audition and it went to network, which is like the last thing you do before it's an actual show. Wow. And so they got me this uh, manager at this place called Handprint Management. And she was like, okay, you're like a ex snowboarder meets this. You know, they try to categorize you. And I was like, yeah, whatever. And she said, well, we've got this new show that we're pitching to MTV, Spike TV and VH1. And uh, tell me what you think about it. And she puts on the show, and it's fucking a jackass teaser. Oh, my God. Right? And I see I'm in the video. Cody's in the video. And I'm like, who the fuck is pitching this to you guys? It's Jeff Tremaine. <laughs> it's and I Tremaine, was like, right. I'm all, this is going to fucking be on TV? And she's like, yeah. I'm like, yeah, fucking right. Yeah, right. Exactly. And I never talked to yeah. Tremaine about yeah, it. And the yeah, next thing yeah. I know, a fucking jackass is huge. But yeah, yeah. that all came from Blunt. But so so I was at, you know, writing and stuff like that. And, and Rawl and Mac Dog and, and Peter and his guys decided to bring me on. And I was like, oh, shit. So not only did that happen, but Jason Bump, who is a pro snowboarder of mine, he got brought on in the art department. Right. So I was like, cool. We're yeah. all moving to San Clemente. And I had ridden for, 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 for four stars. So for um special blend so i knew him and you know what man all the shit that my dad had said to me over the years business wise started to click i started to look at cool. what i had going on differently and where i sucked as a pro snowboarder um i'm not sure that i necessarily made up in at working at four star but i knew this at the time we had the crack and the crack were the forum guys fuck yeah and the crack users were, you know, your cons- your customers and the magazines. Yeah. And yeah. I distinctly remember nobody gave me any guidance on how things should be done. I sat there and I thought about how can we get as much coverage as possible from these guys? And I knew Burton, I think maybe had a staff talk for Joe Curtis, right? Because uh, Jeff and Joe, sorry, uh, Jeff Curtis. And, and I had a relationship with Mathis. And Mac Dog had a couple filmers on there that shot photos. And I knew how these photographers worked. And they got a couple, you know, day rates a month. And that's kind of how they live. And they try to sell photos to the mags and to advertising, uh, to ads for advertisers. And so I hit up Matt. This was like, hey, I'll pay you X amount of dollars a month. Every time these guys leave the air until they hit the fucking ground, I want a picture of it. Yeah. And... We'll pay all your expenses for traveling. You're going to shoot the best guys, and I will handle all the distribution of your photos. You don't have to do shit. So Forum owns the photos. He's he's a staff photographer. The way that we kind of had it was is that Forum owned the photos for a certain amount of time, and then they went back to them. But in that, I brokered Mathis's photos for ads. Yeah, he got paid on from other companies. Yeah, I took all his ads, his uh, photos down to the magazines. And got them oh, wow. picked. Okay. And I had books of yeah. every single rider. There's yes. there's stories about this, but I had books of every single rider. Stacks. Yeah. And yeah. I would go in there and I would go to Shem or I would go to Jeff at Snowboarder and uh, Shem Roos at uh, Transworld. And I'd let them look at them and they would write TW or SB. And then wow. I would say, okay, well, Transworld wants to use this photo of Jeremy for the cover. What do you guys want to do? Yeah. And it got to the point where Nico would lay out the ad, the whole entire interviews. I would record the interview, transcribe it. We would lay the whole thing out. We would hand people packages. Yeah. 
Yeah. They didn't have to do anything. That's we did incredible. it for them. Yeah. And then we duplicated those because you could duplicate photos back then. You were looking at little slides. Yep. And I would send it over to Monster Backside Magazine, to White Lines in the UK, to Japanese Transworld. Rad. We had the crack. Yeah, that's smart. And so, you know, I was able to put it together, but it wasn't, there wasn't any genius about it. It was like, Look who the fuck we had writing for us. Right, right, right. You know right. what I mean? Now there is a bit of genius to it though, for sure. Cause you you, you put the yeah, put yeah. the things I just put the the, the dots together, yeah. if you will. Yeah, well that's really fucking cool. And what a time, right? Right. D- did you go on those team trips and stuff? Oh, like yeah. I've gone after the forum guys for the interviews, and the last guy I interviewed was Vile. Vile. Yeah. And, I heard that one. And it's, he was he was right. He, you know what the funny thing about Vile is is listening to him say that, like he never really fucking did like being around all that shit. I was thinking about it, you know, because you had your Peter, which was kind of like the squad captain. Totally. You had your JP, who was just on another level, and Jeremy right there. Yep. You had Duffy, smile for miles. The kid's a fucking great kid. You had Canadians, Canada's best fucking snowboarder in Devin Walsh. Absolutely. You had BJ, the wonder kid, and then yeah. I want to say maybe Nate. Okay, but here, side story. Form eight. Yeah. Everybody thinks about the form eight. So they call it the Form 8. Sure. I don't think anybody's ever heard the story about how the Form 8 came to be. No, no. Everybody just thinks it's eight guys. So what happened was we're sitting there Friday night at the office. Todd Hahn, props to Todd Hahn, the agent, calls me and he says, hey, and Todd and I talked a lot. You heard what Burton's doing. I said, what's Burton doing? They said, <laughs> Jason Brown wants to put together um, something to compete with Form. They're going to call it Seven. Oh, wow. And I was like, are you shitting me? He's like, no. And I was like, huh. I'm like, all right, hey, appreciate the info. We had an ad due that was already past due. We were famous for, for <laughs> missing ad deadlines. Yep. And I went in, called Steve Ruff, Raul Reese, and Nico in, and I said, here's what Forum's doing. I mean, Burton's doing. Burton's coming after us. Yeah. What do you think we should do? Nico had a picture, an actual picture of all those guys. Did an outline around it. I remember the ad. And drew Forum... <laughs> Eight. Oh my god. And that is how Jay Brown was right. That's so crazy. That's how yeah. it came to be. That's amazing. And there That's was amazing. no like it was no that was like shoot from the fucking hip. Yeah. But once we had that done and it took off, it was like we're it was fire. fucking it running was fire. with this. Yeah. I was doing interviews for years. Yeah. Before Jay Brown said, think about it. Forum forum eight. There was Burton Seven, Forum Eight. Yeah, uh, I was like. So the thing ah, was, is they know. hadn't introduced uh, right seven yet. Right, it was a line that was going to be a production that was, or you know, a, a board series that was going to be in their production line. Totally, and they hadn't run any ads or anything. Oh wow! And we slipped that ad right before the deadline. What a bummer for and them. I think you know, I was kind of you know, there was a lot of egos over at Form then, um, obviously with the riders and stuff like that, and. I think we're all adults now where we can admit it rough. And I didn't necessarily think that obviously any of the success was because of me, but I had a, a part in it. You know what I mean? Yeah, of course. What I did in my title at my game, I was doing really well. And I understood the mentality of all the other kind of marketing magazine kind of people. Yeah. I distinctly remember going to a trans world conference when they had those. Yep. And uh, the editors of the magazine being up there and the staff writers and team managers and marketing people complaining because their people weren't getting enough shots. Right. And and they wanted to see more of this in the magazine. And the editors were saying, this is what we're looking for for the magazine. Yeah. And I'm listening to these guys argue with them. And I'm saying to myself, they're fucking telling you. Yes. What they fucking want. Just fucking give it to them. Write that shit That's down. all I fucking yeah, did. Yeah, and yeah, the yeah. next year at the Transworld Conference, they had me up on the panel for some reason. And, <laughs> and all these team managers and guys were asking me, like, why are you guys getting so many photos? And I gave them some generic answer, like something like, it's, it's all about your program. Like, you guys have a pipe program. And you guys want to do the Olympics. That's your fucking thing. Totally. We're going for videos. But I never gave them the formula, but the formula was right there in front of them. They just didn't want to hear it. Transworld was... So I've interviewed Kevin Kinnear, who who started yep. Transworld. And he came from a surf background. He's unapologetically not a snowboarder right. in his heart. Like, he can carve and stuff. He's, right. he's fine. But he, he didn't come from that. He was a nostalgic surfer who was like, oh, I know exactly how to do this magazine. 
no pay for play because what had happened in surfing was you could pay. You bought an ad campaign. You got right. so many covers right. and this and that and the right. other thing. Um, but all through it, Trans World would just say, I was at one of these meetings yeah. where they said, listen, here's what you do. You've got your brand. You've right. got your riders. Right. Look at the list of staff photographers. Right. Hire one of those guys. Right. Use them to do your ad shots, buy an ad, right. and then the other shots from that like shoot surfing. is going to be yeah. the shit that goes in the magazine. And they said, listen, we get from some of these companies, we get, you know, five, 10 submissions a month. From Burton, we get a book. Yeah. Like that's, we get, we get stacks. Right. So if you want us to put your shit in the magazines, just know that Burton is submitting so much. Yeah. <laughs> That's why they get so much. It's not because they buy the ads in the magazine, which maybe helps a little. Right. But, like, get some fucking rad shots with some of our photographers. Well, and, you and know, what I did, I, I tried to make it as easy as possible yeah. on the guys there because they're getting calls from everybody. Yes. They all want their riders in there. Of they're course. They're looking through thousands of photos. I mean, there was times when I was eating cans of tuna and looking at photos till 11 o'clock at night, taking the best ones putting them in these books, organizing these books, keeping all my staff photographers to make sure that we're getting the shots and they're getting to me. And I would take those books and I would go down there and I would buy those guys pizza. And we'd all sit there, there you go. for hours. Yeah. And in yeah. the difference between what Burton did and what we did is I was there yeah. with the photos. I didn't leave them there. Yeah. I didn't let them, you know, sit on them. I got Look at the panties, pull the pants back up, <laughs> yeah, yeah, take yeah, it away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then I would get calls, you know, and I wasn't doing it to be manipulative. I was trying to get my guys No, that's coverage. your job. Right, that right. Your and, job. and so then I would get a call like a week later, like, hey, man, what are you, what are you thinking? You think we're going to get those photos? Uh, nice. And it, listen, yeah, the yeah. only reason why it worked is because we had the riders we had. That's it. If I would have had any other riders on there. Yeah, you couldn't fudge that stuff. You couldn't, you couldn't, uh, yeah. Those. I mean, we had all the freaking best guys at the time. Yeah, you know? yeah, it's that. That's such a fun team. And like I said, interviewing a bunch of them and hearing, like, because I'm this outsider guy that really my access to it is media. Right. So I'm watching videos going, oh, these guys hang out together all the time. They ride together all the time. Right. But the reality of it is, it's you know, each guy is like an independent contractor getting his shots with his right. other guys. And like what Vile was saying. It was probably even you calling him going, Vile, dude, yeah. up your shit. What's going on? It was interesting, you know, from from coming from the riding aspect, going to this management position, and um, it was fucking intense. Yeah. Um, it was intense because of what the where the level, where the bar was. Mm. Um, we would sit in meetings much like this at a table, and with all the riders, with MacDoc, all the filmers, and we would do check-ins and I'd be like, guys, like, I get that you want to go do this or go do that. But if your board leaves the ground, we need it filmed and we need a staff photographer on it. Yeah. Because there was a lot of money and a lot riding on this, but these guys excelled. I mean, yeah. you know, I don't know the amount of pressure that they felt, but I know I sat in meetings with Jeremy and JP and those guys were fucking intense. <laughs> and they, you know, maybe they don't say like, I want to be the best, but that was... The vibe. Oh, no, they say. And I, I think and I say, get yeah, why, yeah. you know, Vile would be like, fuck, this is, you know, too much pressure. But like, you know, for whatever, however it came to fruition, that was the tone. You yeah. had Mac Dog, best yeah. fucking filmer and filmmaker. Yeah. Most progressive, right? Maybe arguably, whatever, creatively, you know, you like different videos for whatever reasons. But technically, like he had the guys. He's you know what man, I mean? Yeah. You had really great staff of uh guys that were in um creative uh creating the ads and the look um he had a great team manager um we were on our our game and everybody stepped up and you felt it and so i could understand why you know it was intense for people and i understand why vile said what he said because it was <laughs> not fun times and i'm sure like there's times where you know those guys didn't like me um and for me, I wanted the hard work and the amount of effort that these guys were putting in to be exploited and respected yeah. um, and seen. Yeah, of you know? course. Yeah. And yeah. so I took it real serious. I got real serious. I went from being a complete jokester uh, snowboarder to like, 
I took a lot of pride in making sure that um, that we were doing what we could to help these guys out. That last sentence you said reminds <laughs> me that Kearns was working there for the uh, for for the video. Yeah, like uh, the resistance, especially. I'm thinking I left right before that. I was on the one that came up with the name resistance. Nice, and I stole it. Check this out. I stole it. There's an old um, Peanuts. Yeah. The Peanuts cartoon. Charlie Brown. Charlie guys. Brown. Yeah. And yeah. Snoopy yeah. was sleeping on top of his little uh, dog shack. <laughs> yeah. And he wakes up in his dream and he's fighting the Red Baron. Yep. And he's flying on the little um, doghouse and he says, La Resistance. Oh my God. And amazing. for some reason, <laughs> that was the name that shouted out at me. And I had this concept of. And I had left before this um, movie got uh, finished. Yeah. Um, I'd left in March, and um, that was after the season. The movie had come out in like September, October. But my, my vision for it was having Peter be like the general, yeah. the gnarly, yeah, hard, yeah, like yeah, making yeah. sure everybody's doing their job. La resistance, we're going to win, you know, all that shit. And they came up with something similar yep. in that, you know, but I never shared that with them. That was just my thought about it. But anyways, That's amazing. so Kearns had come in after I had uh, left. Yeah. he. I, I just remember him saying to the team or to who he was filming with, I think it was, he filmed a lot with Devin. He yeah. said, Devin, Guys, what if we do a part where there's just not one shot that's filler? Like yeah. every single one is an ender. Yeah. And Devin was like, I'm down. Yeah. And that, that teaming up, but that's that same thing you had just said, which is basically he came from whiskey where they yeah. were making every movie was their last. Yeah. The first one was really the last movie. They were yeah, like, right. let's just fucking kill ourselves. And, and, and Creekside mob, be, yeah. Kearns, Creekside, Creekside mob, mob yeah. baby. Yeah. But then by the time he's at forum, he's hyper focused. Yeah. So like, I think, there must have been a pride to working with the tip of the spear of the progression of the sport. And though that group of guys that would have just been, yeah, work for forum. You know, I, there's a, uh, and circa um, too. Like, I wow. got some stories about that, but so, you know, when we, when, when Kearns came on board, um, you know, I wasn't there, but I had heard a lot that Kearns was, you know, cracking the whip. And I under, I understood that mentality because some of the guys, you know, that are most rowdiest are also the most serious about, you know, excellence and, and getting shit done. Yeah. Yeah. Know? Devin's a great example of that. Oh, yeah. He he could party hard. That was, I've heard it from Johnson and Kearns and Devin, not so much, but they could party harder than anyone was partying. So they win the party. Yeah. Plus they would win the contest. I mean, when I was snowboarding, that's so just, you know, you talked about generations like. You know, JP and Jeremy aren't, and BJ and his and Bajor and these guys and Peter aren't that much younger than me, but right. they went after it a lot different than like the Kearns and Johnson oh, yeah. generation. We fucking partied first. <laughs> yes. We yeah. got hammy fucking hammered. You know, all the stories that you hear. I mean, we were freaking rock stars. It yeah. was the punk rock scene. Yeah. And we snowboarded like we partied, just fucking out of control and crazy and, and, and then that generation, like, you know, like I said, when Peter started flipping upside down and, and Peter partied, but Peter was fucking snowboarder first, you yeah, know? And, yeah. And that started to take over where it became serious in a business. Yeah. And, JP was as serious as anyone's oh, ever been about being and, a pro snowboarder. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, he's one of my goats that, because that, I mean, he, when I saw him do stuff, I was like, I'm <laughs> and he was doing it for a long time. Same with Devin. I mean. You know, Devin and I um, rode together when he was really young, like 15, 16. Yeah, he came up to Bear Valley, right? right. Bear Mountain, and he did or that Bear gap. Mountain, right. And uh, yeah. I saw a lot of good guys get slammed on that gap <laughs> yeah. that were locals. And Devin, and uh, props to Wes Makepeace, one of my favorite people in the world, Sick. did that gap. And this kid was like, he was a kid. He you know, was braces. Kid. Didn't, he, didn't he go over it and in the air? He goes, got it. <laughs> He said, God, I don't remember. I just remember like sitting back and watching and I watched Ryan Imigard, who's, you know, at Volcom now, but yeah. Ryan tried to hit that thing, got slammed. I saw a couple of other guys get fucking slammed. Yeah. And these Canadians came up there and just. Yeah. Devin flew. is Devin's the next level. Yeah. So was Makepeace actually. Both well, those well, Wes Makepeace is one of my favorite writers ever. Yeah. You know, yeah. And he's between, he, I, I did a little bit of filming with him and Kevin. Sick. Kevin, Devin and uh, Wes with oh Mouse, God. Jamie Mossberg. Yep. And I remember um, hitting the jump 
And I did like a big old backside 180 and landed. And I was like, yeah, that felt good. And then I saw Kevin go off it and go about 30 feet farther than me. <laughs> and I was like, I'm fucking done. I said that a lot when I was yeah. around people. So no one was like, these guys. Okay. You're around the best in the world at that time. Kevin, Kevin Young is one of the most styly snowboarders of that. Well, and this is the Canadian, age. you know, there's the old joke. There's a, uh, you know, how, Hey, how big is that cliff? And you're in Canada. How big is that cliff? Oh, that's 20 feet in California. Those are 60 foot. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So those guys were always doing stuff bigger than us. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the terrain there's incredible. Yeah. The terrain here is insane. I can't believe it. It it's, is, but it ain't nice. the same, <laughs> you know, no problem. No, no disrespect to, you know, American riders, but you know, those, those, those BC boys, those West, you know, uh, yeah. Canadian boys, they, they, they jumped some big It shit. was, it was hard to break into the U S market. Cause really snowboarding is this one sport that was like born and raised in America. hundred yeah. percent. Right. So Canadians have a big part of it for sure. Right. Manufacturing started in Canada and right. in Quebec and stuff. I think it, even in Ontario, Calgary, there were, there were a lot of people backing it up right. and loving it in Canada, but it's, it really did belong to the United States. Yeah. It's, it's of, it's of the States. It's interesting to me though. And I, you know, I listen to other podcasts, obviously and stuff like that, but I got to tell you, like when I think about the form eight, obviously Peter, Jeremy and JP get talked a lot about and, yeah. um, you know, Nate for his kind of, you know, where he went after off snowboard. the rails. Right. Um, uh, you know, Bjorn was, was early on there. I think Vile and, and, um, um, fucking Yoni get talked about, but I'll yeah. tell you what, two of my favorite people, um, Duffy, without a doubt, 100% Canadian, obviously, yeah. huge smile, super talented, came, overcame adversity, but yeah, Devin, man, like, like I think about guys and for how long he's been doing it, yeah, and his scope of work, yeah, I mean, if he's not up there with you know, at least the best. Canadian snowboarder without a doubt, if not yeah. one of oh, the yeah. best oh, yeah. ever sure. snowboarders. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. I, yeah. I don't hear his name get thrown out as much. But the thing about Devin for for Canadians, that if I'm speaking on behalf of Canadians that I know, right? He's the, he. I thought he was the biggest name in the world. Yeah. <laughs> like I, when JP and Jeremy started, like to, like well, now that we're doing history stuff, right. and it's like, oh yeah, they were making more money or whatever. I'm like, really? Yeah. Devin wasn't like the top guy because i was i was all in for Devin, but then i guess a lot of it though is yeah. like who's negotiating your contracts and all that kind of stuff and yeah i think um shit i mean i can't believe like jeremy's riding still the way he is and Devin's riding the way he is and jp's i mean that's you know what i was done at 26 27 and that right, was considered right, old right, right, right these guys are in their 40s and it's in freaking- their blood there's something about the way that they stand on a snowboard like even if they're just carving down the run I saw that at Mount Baker with uh, Jeff Fulton, right? Which he was a com- <coughs> he got Craig into snowboarding, right? And just seeing him turn, I was like, that guy's someone. You know yeah. what I mean? Like yeah. that. There's no way that style yeah. got missed. He's he is somebody important to the sport. And uh, those guys, all those pros at right. that level at that time, right? You didn't get to be a Mark Frank, right? By just like mouthing off, right? Right, right. Like Props no offense, Mark Frank, right? Yeah, yeah no, no offense to like Kearns or any of those guys. Right, and and Sean Johnson probably the most underrated Canadian snowboarder sure. of all times. He was he was really fucking good oh, for yeah. that for that era, without a doubt. Yeah, I'm waxing about Canadians and and the whole. No, thing. well, you but, know, again, when we were you know early on, even though you know, if you will, it was a came from you know an American sport, if you will. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Those guys were you know. You could have a whole show just about all the Canadians that mirrored all the Americans at the yeah. same time. Yeah. You know? Well, the For, smart Canadians went to the States. That's how Kevin Young became Kevin Young. Was right. that he's like, shit. Well, right? but you know, for your, for, for our Chris Roach, you had your Sean Johnson. Right. You know what I mean? Yes. For yeah. our, yeah. you know, yeah. Aaron Vincent, you had your, you know, yeah. that sure. kind of thing. Sure. And so, yeah. I mean, like, you know, Al, for example, Al was a fucking killer snowboarder. And Al Clark? Yeah. Oh, fuck it. Yeah. Right. And so yeah. there's a lot. I mean, yeah. I could name off a bunch of guys that were from Canada that were doing the same kind of things that the Americans were doing yeah. at the same time. Yeah. You know? What era of Sims are you at, at Sims? So when I was at, so I was at Four Star Distribution Forum, Special Blend Foursquare from 97. I was only there for three years. Yeah. And, um, you know, again, there was a lot of egos in, um, 
you know, from a payment standpoint, I was getting paid pretty good. Yeah. Especially, you know, um, I'd work in corporate world and mortgage industry through college. So, you know, I felt like I was getting paid pretty good. Um, you know, when, for whatever reason, Rawl wanted to start, Rawl Reese um, wanted to start a skateboard company and they were trying to get Muska. Yeah. And, um, you know, they kept trying to get meetings with them and this and that, and blah, blah. And, and I finally was like, you know, I wasn't part of the skateboard, um, you know, member of, of or, or workforce there that was trying to put it together. They had a couple of other guys and um, I knew Steve Black, who was the team manager at um, S at New Zealand America. And I told Raul, I'm like, I can get a meeting with Chad if you want. Rad. He's like, you, you're, you know, you're snowboarding. We're not yeah, yeah, skating. Yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah, don't yeah. fucking matter. I can get a meeting with him. And we got a meeting with Rune, Cliffberg, um, Jeff Raleigh, and uh, Muska. Holy um, shit. Right. And we sat down at the Fisherman's Wharf in San Clemente. And Raul really wanted Chad. But Steve um had an idea of all three of those guys, which would have been insane. Oh my God. Yeah. So we put together a meeting and we started Circa. And, you know, I felt like I was an integral part of putting that together, getting uh Chad over there. Not that I got him over there, but I got the meeting going and, yeah. and helped yeah, facilitate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um you know, and so when you start seeing everybody else, you know, happy and successful and you feel like you're a part of it, you know, when you're younger you get a little bitter about that shit. Hundred percent. And when I was at um, working or even riding for a special blend, it was like three people wow. that were there. And then when I started working for them, it was like 15. Yeah. When I left, there was probably 50. Wow. And um, Rawl had brought somebody in over us. All respect to the guy they brought over us, but he wasn't looking at promoting internally. And so That's a couple a people bummer. got bitter. Yeah. And I had a lot of calls from other companies trying to get me to come over there. Cause they'd seen what I was doing. They heard, you know, this guy's blowing up the team and blah, blah, blah. And, um, I'd always kind of said whatever. And I told Raw, like, you know, so-and-so called me and he'd laugh and we'd laugh. And I got a call from a headhunter about, um, Sims. And the guy said, Hey, we're, you know, there's a guy that took over Sims, uh, John Texter, um, who's got the license in, um, we're looking to, uh, to make some changes and Tina Bassett, who was a friend of mine for many years, called me and said, you know, she was on Sims like, Hey, what do you think about it? And I was like, I don't know. And so the headhunter asked me like, what would it take for you to come over? And I gave him a number. Yeah. And it was like, you know, $120,000, you know, $10,000 a month back in 90, this was 2000, <laughs> was a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. That's solid. And I figured it was a nice round number, 10,000 a month. And I told her all like, Hey, um, these guys are offering me 120,000 to come work for him and, and turn around the brand. And he just laughed. It Raw has this laugh, this hyena laugh. Ha, ha, ha. You can never turn around that brand. That brand's it's yeah. junk. And so I like, you know, I had again the ego and I was felt challenged and I was like, oh, okay. So I told the guy, well, what do you want to do with Sims? You know? And he said, he gave me like this bullet point, like six things. We want to revamp the team we want to move it here we want to get a new mac dog movie this this and that i said that's all you want to do he's like yeah i'm like fuck it sign me up wow and so that was in 2000 um and a couple of creative guys had come over with me the sales manager had come over with me and um you know not however the sound is gonna sound but literally in a week i had all those six things done Oh shit! I had gotten yeah. this in with Mac Dog. Mac Dog was kind of you know having issues with with form as it was. Um, we went over, got Mark Frank, Brian Thien, Kurt Wastel, Jason oh, Murphy. Oh, yeah. um, at one time we had John Jackson on there. We had Duffy on there. We had um, the team was Ika killing. Backstrom. Oh yeah. We had um, Guitant Chenot. Yeah. Um, Nico Droz. Neil um, Provo. We had a lot of good guys over there. Yeah, and wow. a lot of the young guys coming up too. And we got covers. I mean, we did, I ran the same program I did at Forum. Yeah. Um, just with different riders. And fuck, man, we had Mark Frank. And I wanted to get Mark Frank on Forum. I, I didn't have much with the team, say, yeah. over there. Yeah. I was more, here's what the team's doing. God, that would have been the product. Good. Yeah. But with Sims, you know, I had... Um, uh, Chris uh, Seda from World Industries come over and he was managing the team. We had Mark Frank on there and 
Yeah, was he the key guy on that team? Do you think you had so many heavies, though? You know, I mean, it's just like saying who's the key guy at Forum. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah, what yeah, I mean? Yeah, There's yeah, just yeah. different ones for different. Yeah, I mean, Brian yeah. and Thien and I had grown up together, and we were good friends in, in high school and really yeah. good friends after high school. And he was like, you know, he got me into snowboarding. And his career, he listened to a couple guys that didn't give him good advice. At one mm, point, he mm. could have rode for Burton. Oh, wow. And he didn't. And he started a company with these other two guys that really didn't go anywhere. And they they just advised him um, in a way that I wouldn't have. And so I kind of took him under my wing on on getting him, reviving his career. And he had a freaking massive career after that. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, he was powerhouse, Marco. Obviously, Wastel. I mean, Wastel was like, in my opinion, a Canadian version of Devin. Yeah. I'd seen yes. Wastel yeah. riding when he was 14, 15 years old, sleeping on couches up in Big Bear. He's solid. And man. he's still going. Yeah, yeah. And, and you want to talk about uh, up-and-comers, like Van Wastel, his kid. Yeah. He's going to be insane. I would bet on that kid. Right. Yeah. And same with the Thien boys. He's got twins, and they're yeah. studs. So yeah. um, we had and we had Tara. Sorry, we had Tara Dakitas. And we had Tina Bassage. Oh my God. On yeah. that team. So we had like crushers. You know, oh. yeah. And so, um, you know, was it form? No. But in hindsight, looking at Sims, I completely neglected the fact of the heritage of that brand. We changed the logo. Right. Right. And right. and got rid of like the hard boot boards, you know, the carving race boards. Right. And we went a completely different direction because that's what I knew how to do, and that's what those guys wanted. Yes. And so it worked for what they wanted and what we wanted to do, but ultimately for the longevity of the brand, I think it was probably a hiccup. It's really hard. They were the very first snowboard team that was like overwhelmingly stacked. Oh. Yeah. yeah. It, it was crazy. If you looked at a case study of Burton and Sims, yeah. And two brands that essentially started at the same time, yeah. Um, there's it's fascinating from a business standpoint one company that makes the right choices and one company that makes the wrong choices yeah and um i took it for granted when i worked for tom um about how much tom actually meant to me in my life Mm -hmm. in that you know if i didn't have snowboarding i would have fucking you know i didn't grow up in a shitty home and you know and, and you know drugs and blah 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 but i chose a lot of I made a lot of bad choices where I would have ended up um, not where I am today. Yeah. And I owe that to snowboarding because, and I owe that to Tom in my mind, because for me, Tom is the godfather of snowboarding. I know some people say Jake and Sherman and Barfoot and all that, but for me, it was Tom. And when I was working with Tom, there was a lot of resistance to Tom. We're not going backwards. We're going forwards. Oh, I got you. And so, you know, I needed to have more respect for who. But that's um, 20 years too early. For sure. But, but my point is, is is that, um, um, you know, in hindsight, I, you know, I would have done things a little bit different, but, um, all props to Tom and, and, um, and that heritage is something that I'm proud of. And I was proud to be a part of Sims. Yeah. Um, but again, if, if, if Tom didn't invent snowboarding, I yeah probably wouldn't be here having a conversation. Ah, that's with sick. You. Right. Well, you guys did the West, you took over the West beach classic. It was a Sims invitational that year. Yeah. Well, Sim, world championships of snowboarding. Oh yeah. my God. I forgot all about all this stuff. Like yeah. Guar going down to Vegas. You guys had, I went to the vivid girls. Guar, dinner. Vivid. Were you at that dinner? So, so the one thing that I, yeah, the one thing that I understood <laughs> yeah. about, um, you know, when I got to take over the marketing and like have it be my ship instead of form. Yeah. Um, my philosophy was as long as they get the fucking name, right. As long as they get the name, right. Right. Get as much exposure as you possibly can. Sure. Now, again, you know, there's a little bit of ego there because this is my thinking. I'm not thinking about Sim snowboards, this brand that has all this heritage. I'm thinking about, we're going to fucking put it to the people and we're going to make them remember this name. Yeah. I mean, I remember getting a call, you know, we did an, an ad with Mark Frank and it was the evolution of, of Mark Frank and his graphics. And he's goes from being, you know, a, this uh, caveman dragging a woman by her hair all the way to having this side piece woman. <laughs> and I got so much hate, mail, phone calls, media about how, you know, misogynistic it was and this and that, blah, blah. And I remember this woman calling from some group. And they said, we're going to go to Bear Mountain and we're going to protest your brand. We're going to boycott Sims and we're going to have banners and we're going to have news crews there. And I was like, okay. 
And I said, okay, um, do you want me to make the banners and the t-shirts and everything? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and she yeah. was like, what do you mean? I'm like, I will print you boycott Sims, ban, brand, uh, whatever, banners, t-shirts, with if, the if right, you, if you can guarantee yes, that the yes. camera's going to be there, she's like, "I don't think you understand. We're boycotting your brand." And I said, "I don't think you understand. Right? I will support that. Yeah, because that was my mentality, you That's know. So awesome, the vivid dude. thing and the guar thing was all for like, you know, it made a splash though. That was the yeah, thing. but it because didn't have longevity. No, but it, but it was like okay." we'd hear about it as buyers for a store. Hey, yeah. Sims is coming back. You go, yeah, so who gives a shit? Yeah, exactly. And that's but, what I didn't want to have happen. But then what ends up happening is all of a sudden, you know how it is. Yeah. 10 years of SIA in Vegas, like there's always something. Right. Like, do you have tickets to the ride yeah. party? Right. Do you have tickets <laughs> to the vans? <laughs> you know, Palmer's going to fight. Uh, well, who was it again? The uh, the skater Skateboard guy. Simon. Yeah, yeah, Simon. Right. Woodstock. Yeah. Like, and I feel, and maybe it's because I was invited, right. I feel like that vivid dinner that and the guar one. thing yeah. was like what people were talking I about. I forgot about that dinner. It was like Benny Hanna's or something, right? Yeah. Yeah. It yeah, was no, crazy. It was good. And, and it was crazy. I went with Scott Surface somehow. Yeah. I, it was like an invitation only thing. And we, well, somehow, Scott Surface and I were boys. So yeah, probably, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. figured something out. But, you know, I, I it, going back to Forum and Special Blend. So I was involved, I was in charge of media and promotions, which wasn't just snowboarding. Like, we, I did all the SIA, SIA parties. So when mm. we had the Fuji show up, nice. we had Red Man met the man. Like we were doing all that stuff. That yeah. translated over to uh, Sims. Yeah. So when we did the Sims World Championships, like I, I was the one that put together all, you know, not to me, 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 but like, no, this is all I forget all the shit that I did, yeah. but we yeah. put together the bands, cool. all the bands up there and stuff like I that. I don't even remember who played there. Jurassic Five, Dilated Peoples, um, who was uh, the. Um, if you move, we move just like that. Um, <laughs> the dude from the Dirty South. Oh, I'll think of his name, but you know. That was so fun. Like the, and that was the same thing. Was like, okay. Like, so at first it was like, so what? Sims is coming back. Yeah. Then it was like, holy shit. Yeah. They're stacking the team. They're doing all this promotional stuff that's insane. Right. Conversely, when I was at Forum and I would ask, like, what's my budget for this year? Yeah. They would ask me, how much do you want to spend? Right. Be like, well, it doesn't work like that. Yeah, like, give me a budget. Yeah, I need like, it. like, what are our sales and yeah. all this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. no, you just, what do you want? I remember literally getting $500,000 in cost of product <laughs> to be able to give away. <laughs> okay. So when I went to Sims, oh I was like, how much is my budget? Why give away that much? That's insane. Well, because we had Wyclef wearing it. We had Joey from Friends okay, wearing it. You. We had. Oh, yeah. So, that is so, true. so that in is my true. mind, right, right. in my mind, it was crazy. Yeah. And I was the one requesting it. I thought if I asked for 500, they'll give me 250. Yeah. Marcus, boom, 500, no problem. Holy we had a cage in the back of yeah. the team room, especially built. And there's legendary stories about it. Like people come in there with grocery carts. <laughs> Load up shit. But for me, that wasn't really what I wanted it for. I wanted it for, you know, I was thinking big, like mainstream, like friends was having, you know, 20 million people a week watching that show. Yeah. And here's Matt LeBlanc wearing. How freaking, did that even happen? You just get it on set to set when, dressing? When, or uh, when I rode for Joyride, um, we did this uh, thing for MTV when they used to do like the snowed in. Um, and they would have snowboarders and skiers oh, to come there, right? And yeah. so I did some on-camera stuff, and I had oh, nice. hooked up with a couple of producers that I knew, um, and um, uh, clothing people, wardrobe people, and they started getting my name out there, like, "Hey, you want some cool attire?" What this is, you know, fast forward, I went to a forum, and I still kept in touch with everybody, but you know, hey, the MTV people want to wear our stuff, we'll send it to them. No, but I know this girl over here and this nasty little man and, you know, yeah. like, you know, um, uh, what's his name called? Uh, what's what's uh, Justin Timberlake? 98 <laughs> Degrees, when he was in 98 Degrees, they wanted to wear our stuff at Snow Summit. And I was like, not having it. We're not, <laughs> we're not having a boy band. Like, Method Man wants some shit, yeah. we'll send it. But we were, so it got to the point where we were like, Cutting people off. That's insane. Now, you know, yeah. no offense to Justin Timberlake, but yeah. he's in the boy yeah. band. Like, we don't want to. No, I got you. We already I had a boy you. band yeah, for yeah, the yeah. team, you know? <laughs> yeah. But so um, I kept those contacts and um, I rolled them all the way through for him and rolled them all the way through through Sims. Yeah. 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 How did you hook up Guar? That 
Good call. Well, you know, so here's the deal. Like, all props to Peter Line because that was a Peter Line thing at D23. Yeah, you bit it for sure. But that um, was, but and the it was way dope. that that the way that worked out, I was with um, Trevor Story. No, not Trevor Story. Um, um, fuck, I can't remember Trevor's last name on off the top of my head. But oh, Trevor O'Neill. So I was with Trevor O'Neill, who Canadian. It worked at um, Gen X when Gen X had Sims, mm. and. Um, once Jamie finally made that transition to get Sims, he, you know, wanted to sign me. So he flew me back up there and put me in touch with, with Trevor. Trevor's about my agent. We went to a Guar show. First time I'm meeting this guy, oh, we're wow. going to a Guar show. Rad. And admittedly, I'd never been to a Guar show before. And I was like, okay, well, let's see how this is going to be. And I went to the Guar show and it was fucking amazing, as you can imagine, and blood's everywhere and blah, blah, blah. And I'm watching guys in business suits and I'm like, why the fuck is this guy here in the mix getting body parts tossed on him and he's just in love with the thing? Yeah. And so um, Trevor was a creative guy and he told me, he's like, it would be cool to do a um, board series with these guys. I said, you want to do one with them? I said, yeah, I'd make that happen. And so, you know, I didn't really think about the fact that Peter had done it, and we wanted to do it a little bit differently. Yeah, Peter had done, um, like, a little... Right, right. But, I mean, you know, like, there's an old saying, bad artist copy, good artist steal. Sure, and sure. And so, you know, sure, it was sure, kind of, sure, like, sure. on the border <laughs> there. Um, and so we did that, and <laughs> those guys were cool. Dave Brock and the boys, rest in peace. But, yeah, we had a yeah. lot of fun with that. They got us in a lot of fucking trouble in Vegas. Yes, uh, where I'd never been on the lower floors that go down below the casino <laughs> where the fucking mobsters take you. But right. I got to experience that. That's chaos. No, dude, Dave. They literally had Dave Brocky, if you can imagine, lead singer Guar, um, in a chair with those handcuffs that go over the top of the chair. Oh, my God. And he was sitting there and he was looking at me. Yeah. Like, I'm going to fucking do something. They brought me down there. And the, the mobster guys, when they were bringing me down there in the elevator, they pushed the, that button that has the key, and that's the only oh, fucking way no. you can go down. And we're going down there, and, and I remember one of the guys saying, he's like, who the fuck brings a disgusting fucking guy like this here with a two-foot fish cock <laughs> into a family establishment? And we're in a fucking casino, and yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's family establishment, okay? And I'm like, listen, I'm sorry, blah, blah, and he's... Dave's fucking drunk and yep. pissing people off, and I took responsibility for him, got him out of there. Oh, good for you! But man. it was scary. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyways, uh, that turned out good. And I think if you know, if you remember that trade show, I do. We had the vivid girls and fucking Guar in the Walking same booth around. at the same time. I'm fucking believable. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't really well thought out. No, that was dope. It was dope. It yeah, was, I mean, like, you know, you remember it. That's the thing. Is that's what we were trying to do is, you know, and the vivid thing, obviously sex sells. That was easy. And I knew we were going to get some controversy for it. Um, the creative guys came up with an idea of, you know, shipping it in a black bag so you couldn't just see it on totally. the floor. Yeah. And I think we had two versions. One, they were in bikinis and one, they were... That's right. So the ones on the floor had bikinis and the ones in the bag, they were naked. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was, I mean, it was a genius thing for sure. It definitely was like, okay, they're trying really hard here. <laughs> they're definitely trying really hard to go. I mean, but like when I think about Tom Sims himself, like the beginning of the brand, him leaning up against the wood barn or whatever with the chicks and bikinis, like that well, was, you know, his, and, and getting vibe. the ticket from the cop and then, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, you know, um, um, spraying that skier and stuff like totally, that. Totally, man. It's yeah. Fucking James yeah. Bond for yeah. a minute. You know? he, yeah. He, him and Steve linked. The, that the thing that I didn't before. equate to was when I was at forum, we couldn't do anything wrong. Right. When I was at Sims seemingly didn't seem like we could do anything right. <laughs> okay. Because you know, how do you equate all this hype that we're getting to sales? Right. Great. Those right. Sims guys are doing right. that. Right. Still not going to fucking buy a boards. Yeah. I think we were pretty tentative with our order. We, right. It wasn't like we did, like, it, it wasn't like you jumped the queue. Right. It's like, okay, we'll see if we can sell these. Well, that and, and we'll you put gotta, them on the wall. Much like the yeah. video part, yeah. like when you know when you're pushing over, you get a video part. Yeah. You do something. Yes. It's a wave effect. It takes years back then for that. It's a ripple effect of, of when is it actually going to be you know, noticeable in sales. Right. And so you could do something this year. It's not going to come out till next year. And then the following year when people are going to actually respond to it. Right. When you actually have the spreadsheet of what the sales were. Well, that and, right. and because videos didn't come out 
until a year later, right? Yeah. Then they come out and they're in the market for a year. So that's two years. Totally. So if you're doing all this cool shit, yeah. it's not going to show up in sales for two years versus today. I mean, I can't tell you how many snowboard clips I've watched where it was yesterday yeah. or today. Well, and it I was like, up, it, well, I, that, I, and, yeah, and it's yeah. a, it's a 10 second clip. Yeah. That's an amazing clip, yeah. but there's so freaking many of them that it's lost in the mix. Yeah. yeah. Back yeah. when I was snowboarding and you had a video, like, like when I lived with Whitey and Whitey came home and he said, I shot the, the biggest air I've ever seen. It was Ingemar Backman. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and yeah. he showed me the photo and I was like, what the fuck? Now that photo sat there for months and months and months before it was on the magazine. Right. Well, I start talking. Yeah. I tell you, you tell somebody. Now the yeah. romance yeah. Yes. of totally. this photo and the idea of what it is, and you fucking can't wait for that thing to come out. It's unreal. Yeah. It's there. Yeah. I remember now, that. boom. Yeah. You go on your Instagram, it's there. It's a completely different way of marketing um, today. And so for there, so for all the things that we did, you know, with Sims, it was going to take years for that to even translate into sales. Well, there, and okay, so you already said you didn't really take the history into account oh. as much. And I think that was the thing too. People had been burned with Sims a little bit, right? So if you don't, if you're not taking that into account too, like you're coming into a, a market where like you're coming from forum where everybody's like, you know, they, they announced that they were coming back. Yeah. And within the industry, <coughs> A bunch of people were like, hey, do you have numbers for these guys? I'm thinking about doing, like, maybe I'd be a good rep or maybe we'd be a good distributor up in Canada. Like, what are they going to do? What are they, like, Forum was like this hype, and whereas Sims was kind of like, it had been kicked around a bit. Yeah, and, you know, and I, you know, I was um, young enough and dumb enough and had big enough ego to think that we could figure it out. I mean, you know, like I said, the guy... John Texter gave me a list of six things to do. I had them done literally in a week. Yeah. And I remember even going to the trade show after we produced everything. And I just told him, I said, Hey, I'm, I'm done. I don't, mm. I don't need to be here anymore. And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, you gave me the six things to do. Yeah. I did them. Yeah. I'm already fucking burnt. I don't really want to be in the snowboard industry anymore. <laughs> wow. And so, you know, like I need like something to challenge me a little bit more. Yeah. Again, ego talking and, and just like whatever, you know? Um, Cause it was that simple to do the problem is and we saw it with form we saw it with sims is it didn't necessarily translate into sales and if you're not running your numbers right right they're gonna bite you every time there's one thing about numbers they don't lie two plus two is always four yeah and, yeah. It, and it doesn't care about you know your team and it doesn't care about anything else and when you don't got shops paying totally. and you know people want their bills paid so that was my biggest and their orders lesson. are getting smaller so what had happened from when i started in the shop in 93 <laughs> 94, everything <coughs> doubled. 90, 95, everything right. doubled. 96, there was like a hiccup year. There's bad snow. For the first time, we saw a bit of a drop. And then 97, it was like forum and back on. And right. all this, you know, sales were big. But then, you know, 98, 99, 2000, everybody had bought in. Ride had gone public. It was right. like every, people had talked about how much money everyone's going to make. Right. And everything was aspirational. It was like, we're going to double, 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 double. Right. But once it's that stopped, right. once we reach critical mass, I remember in 2000, I went to work for K2. Ride was like my, I, I wanted to work for Ride. K2 on them. I get in there. The last thing that I'm concerned with is Liquid and 5150 because they were right. like uh, the crap brands. And Gareth was, Gareth Knocker, our friend was, was running that stuff. And at one point he said, Eric, do you have any idea the number of boards that I sell compared to the ride right. people? Right. Like ride is like a handful of right. boards. And mine are those boxes over there that are stacked to the fucking rafters. Yeah. I've got more warranty boards than those guys right. do all their And boards. that was, you know, that was that, you know, when the big box came and all that kind of stuff and the market was flooded. And, you know, looking back on it, they're. You know, once, you know, you, you can look back at teams like even when Burton and Sims battled way back in the day of teams and exchanging riders and stuff like that. And you had all these other brands come in and then, you know, Joyride had a team and then, you know, um, Type A had a team and Atlantis had a team. And then, Hell yeah. you know, um, Form really like, well, Ride had a great team. And then Form kind of like had a level of riders that were just on another level. But then you had M3. 
who had a great team. Sims had a good team. And now it's like everybody has a decent team or enough. Yes. You know what I mean? So yes. what's going to set you aside? And that, again, in hindsight, like I look at Sims like they had something that For nobody sure. else had, and that For was sure. heritage. Yeah. You know, other than Burton. But again, you know, you make bad business decisions and business partners and... So it you, so is it at, during the Sims time that Salter comes into your, like, yeah, so, so <laughs> into your um, lexicon, <laughs> you know, uh, John Texter, who had the license for Sims had, had, I told you like hit, had a venture capital firm who, who made a lot of money. And I think this is just kind of his toy thing. And he actually came up with this company called Jester, Jester and Jester was, a combination of what is today Apple Music and Facebook. Oh, okay? shit. Where he had, and Sims, the game Sims, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He yeah. had this, it's almost like the metaverse. It was this 3D world that you lived in that you had a character that you could have your clothing that you wanted to, that you could walk around, you know, let's say promenade in San, in, in, in Santa Monica, walk into a store, purchase music and listen to it. Like this whole other world. This was a, 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 a company he came up with. And it was, you know, now I understand a lot more because you got Facebook and Meta and all that shit going on. But back then it was like, what? What is this? Yeah. Well, he dumped a shit ton of money into that. He dumped a shit ton of money into Sims. And, and he dumped a shit ton of money in all this stuff that you would do when you get 200 and something million bucks. Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, he ran out of fucking money. Oh, no. Okay. And let me tell you, one of the first, just to back up, one of the first experiences we had with John Texter and the Sims team. We had gone down to San Diego to watch the video premiere and all the Sims writers were in Mac dogs movies, which was cool. I think Kurt even got the cover. Sick. Um, and to celebrate John Texture was down there and you know, we had a couple of drinks and all the team was around. I said, John, you know what you could do to really show that you appreciate these writers. He's like, what? Well, I'm like, let's load up your jet and go to Vegas, go gamble for a couple hours and we'll come back. No. And he was like, let's go. We loaded up the Sims team in his private jet, <laughs> took off from San Diego in the air, called a casino host that I knew at the Hard Rock and said, we're coming in. We want a marker for like whatever, $100,000. Oh my God. And um, we want some food and blah, blah, blah. Fine. We'll pick you up at the airport. Kurt Wastel got up in front, got to fly the jet. No. Yes. It was cool. <laughs> and and so- um, What a- it oh was pretty freaking baller. And we uh, landed, gambled, won some money, came back. But that was some cool shit. That was some next level shit. Yeah. You know, and and you didn't see that too often in snowboarding or at all. It was the best I could tell, at least back then. This was, you know, 2000. But anyways, John knew how to blew through money. And um, he mismanaged the business. And like I said, like, what's the budget? There's no budget. That was kind of going on at Sims 2. We had an office in Santa Monica. Like, why the fuck would you have a snowboard office in Santa Monica? Um, that was super expensive. A lot of high salaries. Mm. And um, eventually he got himself in trouble. And Jamie's king. Jamie Salter is the king of looking at a situation, looking at the balance sheet, <laughs> looking at where there's opportunity. And I saw him personally put together a deal. I think it was for vocal skis, V O K L yep. where he had them on the phone and they were hemorrhaging money and they were going to go out of business. Jamie bought all their inventory from them, sold it to somebody with the money that he sold the, all the inventory for bought the business and had vocal now under one of his brands that he could mass distribute. He was a genius like that. It was yeah. the same thing yeah. with Sims. Yeah. Sims I, was, I, I don't think people would understand what that mechanism is. Can you do? So, so one of the things I did after working at Sims was I started um, a closeout business, a liquidation business. I learned it by watching Jamie. Yeah. So when you have a bunch of inventory, let's say, you know, you're a ski company um, and you don't sell all your skis, you've got inventory that's basically cash that you paid full price for from the manufacturer sitting there in your warehouse. Well, you've got payroll, you've got rents, you've got all things it takes to run a business. You've got no money coming in because it's summertime. And now for your next year's orders, you've got a purchase order with the factory that you've got to come up with typically half the money to put down. You've got no money. Right. You're going to file bankruptcy. You've got this inventory. Jamie is a master at taking that inventory that you have. Yeah. 
in whatever way he has for distribution, selling it to somebody, typically like for Zanny Group, Costco, right. somebody big where right, you right. don't want the product to go. You right, don't have right. the balls to pull the trigger right, right, to send right, it there, right, but Jamie right. does. Sells the inventory for a million dollars. Okay. Buys it for three hundred. Yeah. And yeah. says, I'll give you seven hundred thousand dollars for the brand. So it requires that the brand that you're buying has some sort of integrity in your business, right? Like so it's like they've been, you know, they've been buying ads in Trans World and paying team riders and doing all the things to make a Who fucking, knows? But all I know right? is this. Jamie had a lot of brands that were once leaders. Yeah. That weren't. Yeah, then he okay. just sells it to the to the. I mean, Jamie stores, had right. a lot of shoe brands. Jamie had Lamar, Sims, you know, um, Hell yeah. Liquid, yeah. 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 5150. He had all yeah. those yeah. brands, yeah. all the brands that were a brand at one point. Yeah. He had got, and the way that he did it was he would go to Frizzani, Big Five, whoever it was, and say, how many snowboards do you want at $50? Right. And they'd say, well, for $45, we'll take 100,000 boards. Right. Jamie would go to China and say, I need to build 100,000 boards for $25. Yeah, yeah. And he would work on razor thin margins. And now you're looking at a total business with Gen X that had all these brands and a closeout division that was doing $90 million in, in sales. Jesus. And, and the way that he ran his business was super tight. So if he profited $9 million on that $90 million, he could find somebody to buy the company for a hundred million bucks. Right. He's genius like that. That's insane. And that's like the level yeah, that yeah. I understood him being at. Yeah. Now he's with, yeah, he's, he's, you know, it up authentic a brands and, you know, <laughs> 5 billion or whatever, $12 billion company. He's yeah. doing the same thing. Yeah. But with big brands. On a like bigger level. So when I, Reebok when, or whatever. Yeah. When I was on my way out of Sims after Jamie had sold it to Huffy Huffy had gone bankrupt and then it went somewhere else and I was just done dealing with it. I had saw what Jamie, how Jamie did this. And there was a lot of brands in the industry that would never sell to Jamie. Of course. Right. Right. But that I had relationships with that would sell to me yeah. and trust me with their product. And so right. Right. ultimately I got out of the cool side of snowboarding and went into the money side of snowboarding. Well, who was your Forzani group for you? Like did who could you who did you So have I didn't I didn't, with? you know, um I, I I looked at more on a micro level than a macro level. Like Jamie would make one call yeah. and get a half a million dollar purchase order. Got it. I had like thirty to forty customers like core shops still yeah some core shops and some you know online started to take off uh, i also gotcha. had an online store i had a relationship with tj maxx and marshall's and 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 all those guys and you know well those are the four zany group for down here right right but at the time um you know canada when you know somebody throws a pebble in the water everybody hears about it here it's a yeah. little bit different you know you can, yeah. and we didn't have the internet like we have now and all yeah. that different stuff yeah. and and the sales managers would call me and say sell it to you wherever it goes your responsibility was responsible for it and they would know like yeah probably sell it somewhere they don't want but it wasn't on them anymore they could blame me so got i went it. from got like it. you know right 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 form like oh they form to sims like eh, to like Closeout guy? <laughs> yeah. You're a yeah, fucking yeah, closeout yeah, guy yeah, now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like I said, I mean, my 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 level of friendships changed. Of course. Because of that, the guys that I'm still friends with, I'm always friends with, it's cool. And the guys that were friends because I was somewhere, I get it. That's how kind of business works, yep. you know? Yeah. Um, but you know, I was um working out of my house. I had a, a pick and plat pack warehouse. I didn't have any of the product. Um, in warehouse, unless I had it sold already, right. I was running lean and mean and making a lot of money and was able to invest it in the right things. And, um, for all the hard work that I did in the snowboard industry at the brands that, that didn't equate to probably as hard as I worked, I made up for in, in, in the closeout business. Yeah. See, I, so I went to, uh, this guy who just seemed rich to me, right? I, I, he, he was putting together a mutual fund. He seemed like a money guy. Right. He'd come into the shop in suits. I'm like, what do you do? He's like money stuff. Right. So will you mentor me in money? He said, sure. Right. I said, okay, my plan is I'm going to leave the boardroom. I'm going to open up a boardroom like retail store right. 
And actually, at the time, I said, I'm going to do American Apparel. Right. I'd called Dove Charney. Right. He didn't have his stores yet. Right. And I said, we should do a store in Vancouver that only sells American Apparel. Right. And he goes, you're talking my language. Right. Find a spot. Call me right, up. Right. Do it. So I go to this financial planner. I go, I got a money idea. Right. And he says, retail sucks, dude. He's Don't not do wrong. Retail. <laughs> and, I, and, and so what he told me to do was wholesale. And then I learned through wholesale, holy shit, this is perfect. You yeah. get shit on loan. It's yeah. like what you're talking about with your yeah. pot business. You get shit on loan, right. you sell it to people who pay you, and right. then you pay off your debt. It's like the easiest thing in the world because all you need is a sample. Right. Sometimes all you need is a picture. Right. Right. So, but that was in the inline thing. Right. So when it's inline, then you're like, you're shilling next year's product. Yeah. It's really fun. It's great. And, right. and you're working with these businesses. But when you're in the closeout one, right. you're like, I got 20 boxes of these boots. They're mostly size eight right. and lower. Right. And and you're just selling way more and the prices are, are lower. The thing I liked about it is that it was kind of like I said about Sims, like it got boring for me for a little bit. Got it. In the closeout world, it was always hunting. Yeah. I was yeah. always hunting yeah. for a yeah. deal. I was, I didn't represent one brand. Like no. if I called a shop, I could get you 30 brands right. or whatever it was. Right. And the way that I did it is, um, I had at one point, I think I had like almost $3 million in credit and all the companies in the industry Got it. where I could buy something from them on a discount. Yeah. I'd get 60 days on it. Yep. Okay. I would sell it. So let's say, you know, uh, let's say a snowboard cut. Well, not, let's not use a snowboard. Let's say a pair of goggles cost a hundred bucks at yeah, retail. Yeah. Wholesale is 50 bucks. Yeah. What does it cost them to make it? Let's say 25, 30 bucks. Sure. Okay. I would go in there in the summertime when somebody had a bunch of goggles and say, I'll take 10,000 goggles from you, whatever colorways they are, sizes, whatever. And I'll give you 30 cents on the dollar. Right. So yeah. I'm buying goggles for, let's say 20 bucks. Yeah. Okay. And I sit there and I hold them or I go to Australia or I go to New Zealand on the other and I start selling that stuff and they're paying me cash right away. Right. And I don't have to pay you for another 60 days. Yeah. Yeah. So it was cash intensive. Yeah. But I got to the point where I refined everything where I didn't buy something unless I had it sold. That's, that's you know? the only way. And to then do if it, I right. had anything extra, yeah, I got into retail Horrible fucking business, by the way. <laughs> Never do retail because all your money is in retail. That's it. All your money is in product, I mean. That's it's it. all, you know, you're just basically, you know, trading one thing out for the another and paying employees. And when it all was said and done, I sold all the inventory. That's all the money I ever made. But I did have an online business. Yeah. And the online business, the one thing I loved about it is I could take the best 10% of whatever it is I bought. Yeah. And I could sell it for full markup. Yeah. Right? Like retail. Right. And while I'm sleeping... Stuff is selling, and I wake up in the morning, and I got a bunch of orders, and I have somebody ship them, and I'm good to go there. Yeah. But the thing I, lo I really enjoyed about the um, closeout business was it still kept me in the industry, which I liked. Yeah. I got to snowboard with all the people that I wanted to snowboard with, the people that were actually friends, um, and it made good money. I mean, it was good margin. You know, if I did a million dollars in business, my margin, net margin, was typically 30 40%. That's big. There's not too many businesses you could do that. So, for example, like... Any brand, let's say electric, does all the marketing, all right. the team, all the right. promotions, all the right. everything, and they got 10,000 glasses that they couldn't sell. I don't have to market. I don't have to promote. I don't have to worry about the team. I don't have to worry about shit. I got to pay them and move the product in a way that's going to be respectful of their brand and their image, which is what I had over Jamie. Jamie was doing $35 million a year in closeouts. Right. I think my best year I ever did was like three or four million. Yeah, but I was doing a one person with an assistant That's with a pick and pack, That's and um, I was doing it in a respectful way. Like I would get into like when I told you what Jamie told me. Jamie told me like I'm glad you're in the closeout business. If you fuck up, I'm gonna fuck you. <laughs> well, Jamie would sell to Frizzani, and guys knew that I didn't sell it to Frizzani. No disrespect to Frizzani, but. That's not what people wanted their product back in the day. Right, right. Yeah, because yeah, it's tough for, like, at a retail level, I remember going into Winners, which is our kind of, yeah. like, Marshalls yeah. or whatever, yeah. and and seeing, like, cool shit in there and being like, what the I fuck is this? I sold a lot of stuff but in then, Winners. <laughs> I sold a lot of stuff in Winners. <laughs> but the thing about Winners, too, is that 
it's it's such weird shit. Sometimes it could just be a shop went out of business, yeah, yeah. right? Like so, yeah. like it's it was definitely. And there's no one at Winners you can be like, oh hey, who sold you guys this, yeah. right? And so then it was all old stuff, right? And you, it, you, if you were mad about it at a shop level, going like, well, this makes the shit look lame, right? That you can buy DC shirts that we're selling here, compare at like we're selling them more than the compare at, right? But at the same time, you kind of go, well, it's a different business. It's necessary evil. Yeah. You know, I, I used yeah. to chase guys like Jamie out of the booth at Form. Sure. Because I, you know, that, that, that was my mentality is these guys are fucking up snowboarding. Oh, big when time. I heard the podcast about Jamie and yeah. saw all he actually did for snowboarding, it was pretty cool. And all props to Jamie. Jamie's a businessman. Um, I think over the years, as he's had a family and grandchildren, he's getting, it's cool to see him really get into family. Yeah. But, you know, he's. Yeah. He's a, he's a monster when it comes to business and I respect him for that. And, you know, I got a great education from him about, yeah, yeah. um, the closeout business. I, I mean, I owe a lot of what I have to him too, just by yeah learning from well, watching him. Well, one of the things about Jamie, so first of all, Jason Ford said, have you interviewed Jamie Salter? And I was right. like, why would I do that? Right. Like he's the devil. Right. And he goes, no, no, he was just the business guy. Like yeah. he was like, people will say, Jake was business. Tom was like the rider. Right. Or J- Tom was core. Right. But Jamie was more business than Jake even. Oh, yeah. Like way more. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like watching at the end of his episode. I he's saw like, that. Donna, Donna, I'm going to buy your company. Right. I want to buy your company. Which is like, oh, my God. And so many people reached out and said, that guy, like, kiboshed the team. I stopped getting checks when he started owning the thing. I Like, yeah. I feel like he owes me all this money. I'm like, I get it. Yeah. I get it. Jamie will streamline something. I mean, he's, you know, it's, it, it's a different world, you know, it's, it's, you know, like, like, uh, athletes going to, uh, f- financial banker banquet. It's just two different worlds. And in his world, like he's well-respected and, um, he's good at what he does. Yeah. And I tell you what, if he says he's going to do something. Well, ABG his is his retirement thing that he just he made that for his yeah he had already retired then he was then he was bored and so he started abg to give his kids something to do Uh, isn't that insane and it's like you know i i was going through what he owns with with this guy nando you probably know nando he was at silence and he does music stuff right now he's coming back well i i I sat in jamie's office and watched him uh trade stocks and make a million dollars in one trade. <laughs> and this was in 2003. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, yeah. he's not. He's His not office hurt. now looks actually quite a bit similar in your house. That's what the first thing I was thinking. His office is the size of my house. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> first of all, he's got behind his desk, there's a picture of Muhammad Ali with the Beatles and everybody has signed it. Yeah. Well, I mean, he probably owns the freaking license to Muhammad Ali <laughs> or the Beatles, right? I mean, <laughs> I don't know about the Beatles, but definitely. I Muhammad mean, Ali. so when I see what he did yeah. and how he did it, yeah. I understand it by what I saw when I was working with him, meaning I could see how the same process that he used to make millions of dollars yeah. is how he's making billions of dollars. And it's not that if you will genius i mean it's genius no 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 I but i mean yeah, jamie yeah, yeah. just like he's driven he knows numbers he knows how to streamline things he knows how to get to put together management he's got great relationships and you know one of those, the, the way that i would kind of um look at it is this is there's things in your mind that you tell yourself oh god that seems big like buying a house man that's buying yeah. a house is a big thing or doing this is a big thing and then once you do it you're like piece of cake yeah and i think when people look and they think like you know jamie's worth however many billions of dollars you think god oh it's such a big number it's like the little things that he was doing yeah are the same things that he's doing now yeah just yeah. on a bigger level yeah yeah i yeah. see that i see that for sure there is a divide between the kind of person who can like you said, basically be a snowboarder who's like a homeless person. Right. Not a homeless person that's like picking right. through a dumpster, but like 
you're sleeping where you've crashed. Yeah. You're just, and you're in, but vagabond, things, but yeah. you're in these different towns right. and you're at these events that are so fun right. that you're like, just being here is worth it. I don't give a shit if I sleep in a van right. or in a tent in the woods, right. I'm going to sleep in a tent in the woods until I find a job and figure out Whistler. Right? right. Like that. A lot of people did that. And that's what, you know, we, we, that's what we did. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. We were, I distinctly remember with, you know, Jason Bump and Bobby Meeks and Hidden and a couple other guys where we would um, go to Utah. We'd go to Deseret Industries, DI. We would buy, which is like their thrift shop out there, the Mormon thrift shop. We'd buy all <laughs> of our furniture. We'd put it in an apartment. We'd sign a lease for six months. When snowboard season was done, we'd donate it all the way, all back to DI. And then we would, you know, you'd go to Hood. Yeah, because you knew you'd get a little bit of that coach money and free food and camping and yes. sell your boards and your clothing to the Japanese that would come over <laughs> and you'd get stupid money for it. Yep. And then towards the end of summer, you'd go. We'd go down to San Clemente and literally props to Keith Wilson and uh, uh, George. Uh, um, God, I can't. George's name Kleckner, I think it was. Or oh yeah, Kleckner's the union. Union. Guy. Union. Yeah. 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 Sorry, yeah. George. But uh, I literally slept underneath their stairway. We put a sheet <laughs> underneath their stairway. They would walk up and they'd let, like Bump would sleep on the couch. If, if he had a girl, he would sleep under the, the stairway and vice versa. <laughs> and we'd surf all summer. Yeah. And then November would come around. We'd move out to Utah. He did that for years. And so like, you know, homeless, <laughs> you know, vagabond, gypsy, like that's just the way you did it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And that was, God, man, those are some amazing times. Well, I would, I would argue like I'm probably, st I, I'm not homeless, but right. I'm still doing that. I don't own a home. <laughs> I don't have a lot of stuff. You know what I'm saying? But that's I would argue. That's a great argue, position to be in as, as much as, as, the, as society says, no, uh, that's a great position. It's kind be. of the same thing as you said with the snowboarding. Snowboarding as a professional is just not as fun as snowboarding for yourself. Right. So, you know, the things you own, own you right. and some way shape or form you can't just up and leave and and go to tahoe when it's snowing you know what i mean right. but there is a there's probably a very healthy in between where you own some stuff and then you do the things for yourself to keep your mind healthy your body healthy that kind of thing right you know when i when i had my uh kiddo eight years ago i um i looked at my balance sheet and i looked at my passive income and you know what i had in the bank and I looked at the the life I had been leading because I didn't stop having the snowboard party mentality till I had my kid. Because mm -hmm. um, I was, you know, still selling. I was doing closeouts. I was traveling all over the place and trade shows. I was still partying. I was still getting rowdy. Um, but I looked at, you know, this kind of blessing that I didn't see coming. And uh, I looked at what I had. And I, you know, I have aspirations of being a billionaire at certain points, but I looked at what it was going to cost me. Mm -hmm. um, and it was going to cost me time. And it was going to cost me time with my son in those formative years. And um, currency is looked at in a lot of different ways. But for me, time is your most valuable currency in that you can't get more of it. You can't replace it. Once it's gone, it's gone. Um, the money side helps in being able to use that currency in a way that you want your time. Yeah. And so I stopped, um, working full time at that point and just focused on my investments and my passive income and spent, spent my time with my kid and, you know, nothing will age you like having kids, <laughs> as you know. Um, but you know, I think about, you know, being a late, an older father versus a younger father <clears throat> and all these things that kind of keep me grounded and you know not able and i say grounded and not being able to just take off when i want to take off yeah. and stuff like that yeah of course um um but i tell you what for 42 years um and a lot of those you know in my 20s to 42 i freaking lived like a rock star i did whatever the hell i wanted to do i traveled i spent money i you know i got too many damn stories that to tell and blessed and uh, none of them mean more to me than being able to spend time with my kid and watch him grow and, and, and be this little person that he's being. Um, and that requires me to have the things that yes. <laughs> keep me stuck yeah. in the house and yeah, those kind of things. Yeah, Not that I couldn't do it another way, but you know what? We get enough time to go do cool stuff. 
you know, this kid's been traveled quite a bit and been out in so many duck ponds and deer hunts and fly fishing trips and knows more about, I mean, you can see, I don't know if you can see this, but all these little wall clay art is all his different ducks and turkeys. And he can tell you what each one is. And that's amazing. Yeah. And he spends a lot of time doing that. So I find a lot of joy in that. Um, and I still have the chase in me and the, the, the powder days that I want to get at. It just, yeah, just turned into more like, you know, I, I call those duck days with my kid kind of thing. I got you, man. I, <coughs> yeah. I fully transformed when I had kids yeah. into somebody that was like, in the service of someone else. Yeah. I, th- I thought that was, I knew that was what I wanted to yeah. do. And then once the kids were old enough, <laughs> I, I kind of went back to being myself. Now I actually, I even did go back to partying and drinking and all yeah. that stuff, but it, you need to accept yourself for who you are. For sure. I, I need to accept myself for who I am right. in order to become a, even a better version. Right. So like I was really resistant to the fact I was drinking all the time. Right. And it was only once I accepted it that I could be like, oh, okay, well, yeah. I, I choose, I want to snowboard and be a good dad before right. I want to beat some deadbeat drunk. Like, all right. but the thing is, you're not even a deadbeat drunk. Like I had enough money to, right. to drink all the time. And, and I was going on trips for snowboarding based around, ooh, booze is really cheap <laughs> here or there. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm saving money going here. Taking it back to the yeah. old school. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, but allowing myself to do that and then that that opened up, oh, I can I can choose what I get to do, right? right. Like so for me now, I, my grandfather was an alcoholic and right. I remember being seven or eight or very young yeah. when I heard the concept that if he has a sip, he's going to go crazy and be right. this lunatic he was before. And I right. thought that sounds insane. That what is, what are we talking about here? Is magic whiskey. or something? Yeah. Whiskey. <laughs> whiskey. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. But, um, so I think that the science is in on it. You can, you can reclaim a healthy relationship with alcohol, which is one of the hardest. I've tried a whole bunch of different drugs. Yeah. The hardest one to kick for me was alcohol. Well, I'll tell you what, um, I'm invested in a company, not to plug something, but yeah, there's no, a company dude. called Phil Free. Yeah. It's by Botanic Tonics. Yeah. Okay. It's uh, two ounces, which is about 55,000 milliliters. Yeah. Um, 50 milliliters of it is Kratom. Yeah. 500 milliliters of it is Kava. It's a blend. Yeah. It's an alternative to alcohol. We, uh, I invested in this company last year. We did two and a half million in sales. This year we'll do 38 million. Holy shit. It's, 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 so it's fire. an alcohol alternative. The best way to describe it is it, it creates a feeling of euphoria and okay. focus. Yep. Okay. Um, the kratom's kind of a scare word for people. Big time. Right. Yeah, I don't um, know shit about kratom. Kratom. So it's, it's a stimulant, if you will. And kava is what the Polynesians use. As, kava, I know. Right. Kava it's like a sounds, punch yeah, drunk yeah, thing. Yeah, so yeah. you think about two ounces, it's a very small amount. But it puts you in a very focused state of um, euphoria. And so, um, you know, alcohol is obviously huge, uh, monetarily speaking. It's oh, a huge it's, business. It's everywhere, yeah. And a lot of people are looking for alternatives to alcohol. Yeah. And yeah. so that was something for me. So when I drink, I'm a social drinker. I like being around people. I don't drink at home. i just never been my thing. Um, but when you're working... 12, 14 hours a day and you're making good money with your own business and you're single and you don't have to answer to anybody and the boys call you to go drink. Yeah. You fucking go drink. Yep. And I did that for a long time. And, uh, when I found out I was going to be a dad, um, I got pretty blitzed one night. I'm pretty sure I was, uh, uh, somebody slipped something in my drink, but I'll just take responsibility and say I was blitzed. Sure. And I, um, my son's mother had to come pick me up off the uh, street in town. Oh, wow. And she, uh, you can see my house. She drove me through the gate, parked back there next to the trailer where I had a boat. And um, she parked me in here so I wouldn't get out of <laughs> yeah. the cage. Yeah, yeah. And uh, she went to bed and I woke up in the morning underneath the boat i thought i was being run over by a boat (laughs) and i mean literally like cringing and i was in a suit laying on gravel i went back to sleep and i woke up and i couldn't get in my own fucking house even with a key i had to crawl through the dog door right there oh my god and so i mean it wasn't that i mean that was you know i was just drunk and partying 
But my point was, is I came inside and uh, laid in bed, and um, some hours later, she said to me, like, hey, you're going to be a father, and do you, is this how you want your son to see you, the legend of Travis Wood, the drunk in town? Right. And it really hit me um, how that would impact my son. Because my mom, she still likes to, to tie one on. She's better than she used to be. My dad was an alcoholic and got sober for 20-something years. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember how I felt around alcohol growing up. And so um, I wanted to be very present because I only have one son. And, and I want to be very present in the process. I didn't want to be drunk and, and clouded. And so I didn't drink. Didn't drink for about four years. And... I drink every now and then a beer here and there, but it's just, you know, once you get away from something, it's yeah. kind of like work. Yeah. Once you get away from something, yeah. for me, it was easy to get away from. I got back to my roots. I started hunting again um, and and uh, reading books about um, skin time and, uh, and being a, a dad and stuff like that. And um, I found alternatives. Like, you know, I still enjoy uh, mushrooms once in a while. <laughs> I use THC and CBD to sleep. It helps me sleep. Yep. And the uh, um, feel-free product is if I want to get – it's not it's not like alcohol, but it's a good replacement. But it just gives you that euphoric feeling. And so that's kind of where I'm at. And it's, you know, it's uh, the feel-free, not to keep plugging it, but it's, it's a um, – all natural. It's we're the only we have the patent on uh, non synthetic. Yeah, and um, so you know that's that's where I go these days. But mostly, like I have found uh, so much addiction and clarity in being able to feel things and think about things with a clear mind. And when I have you know my heart hurts or I, you know my dad died a year and a half ago, and when I was dealing with that, being clear about it was. Um, addicting and uh now i get a rush off of being on a peak being in the mountains um that kind of stuff being in nature that's that's where i get my highs from these days well okay this to put it all together for me personally yeah what you're talking about you didn't the the greatest asset is time it's the it's the only thing that's immutable right right right. and the and the thing about drinking a bunch even if you're not like fully addicted or whatever you're not like a terrible drunk that's you know waking up under a boat right (laughs) you're just it's stealing your time yeah because i find when i was drinking if i had six or eight beers i'm like well is it really worth it to go drive up the mountain it's well, just the next day I, and then it and then it takes a away day. Yeah. then it takes away the next day yeah. and but the thing is that waste a day also feels a little bit better if you have a drink so right. you take the edge off right and it just i found that it was stealing my time like if i was thinking about a vacation like i said i was thinking where do we go to drink right. we should go to oaxaca that's where the mezcal right. comes from right so you're going to and and i would also <laughs> say well that's acceptable i like to drink right but i don't like to drink more than i like to be with my kids that's right. for sure yeah i had i had a night where i woke up in jail and the kids were with their mom and so it wasn't my week but i was just like do i really want to be yeah. this guy on the right. weeks i don't have my kids like it's inevitable those two worlds are going to crash together right because I'll go, I'll go on a bender one week when they're at my house and be in jail. Really, that's right. not what I want to do. But I, I struggle with getting rid of it. Like, did you quit cold turkey? You know, the thing was, is I, I didn't really. It, the drinking thing was just something to do. Right. It right, wasn't right, something right. that I really craved. It wasn't right. a, something cool. that I had to have. Like, now listen, I, I had a bout with cocaine uh, early on, and that's that shit that you know. My buddy, uh, um, Simon Rex, the, the actor guy, uh, put it to me like this. He said, there's high vibrational drugs and there's low vibrational drugs. The low vibrational drugs take away from you. You got to keep doing them. You got to keep chasing that mm. fucking demon. Mm. Cocaine, meth, alcohol, I put in those categories. Your high vibrational stuff is your mushrooms. Yeah. You do a mushroom trip once a month, get your mind... Yeah, Boom. Yeah. I don't need to do them every freaking day. I know there are people that are, and I know you can microdose them. Sure. But I don't need to do them every day. So for me, when I was drinking, it was more of, I had no kids, no wife, money, yeah, no responsibilities. Yeah. I could do whatever the fuck I wanted to do. I could buy whatever I wanted to buy. And 
I didn't have to show up at work the next day because I own the businesses. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so yeah. it's like, you want to tie one on? Sure. Let's fucking tie one on. Right. So, you know, now I have a kid. Like, I don't have the time to do that. So that's that it. was more that's about yeah. time. But I also, like, admittedly, an overused term, but I have an addictive personality. Like, when I get into something sure. and I like it, I get into it. Like, I, right now, I'm like, my thing is I hunt. Yep. I had a bout with counts, cancer in 2017, oh, shit. and I had to get really clear on where my food was coming from. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you start going down those rabbit holes of where food comes from, and you can freak yourself the fuck out. Oh, yeah. And so um, around here, we have wild boars, pigs. So Sick. I hunt pigs. So I get pork. I hunt elk and uh, deer. Wow. And I get my meat from there. I've got a garden in back. Yep. Um, I got chickens. Yep. Um, the goat's just their buddy. He's not going to get eaten. <laughs> um, and, you know, I hunt pheasants and turkeys and birds and stuff like that. And so the challenge, the hunt, if you will, I, I, I you know, I, when I talk about Jamie and I talk about other people like that, there's, there's these guys that need to hunt. They need to, you know, they need to keep going. They need to challenge. Yeah. And so the challenge of hunting is hunting where, most people think about hunting and they think about you just going out and killing something. Yeah. Cause that's what people equate it to is killing. Right, but, right. but 99% of hunting has nothing to do with, with killing anything. It's, I feel like Joe Rogan's changed. Like, not, not that everybody, Ooh, that's a trigger word for some people, it's but a big right. trigger word for a lot. Of I people. think he's educated people a lot, but see, that's, yeah, that's yeah. my, I've had that philosophy, not before Joe Rogan, but that's always been my look at it is yeah, that yeah, I, I want to know saying. where my meat comes from. And, yeah. Um, I've done cocaine. I've, you know, traveled the world. I've yeah. had romantic affairs with, you know, famous, beautiful women. I've done a <laughs> lot of shit that a lot of people haven't. Okay. Sure. Um, and there's very few things that give you the kind of feeling for me that, that being out in nature and hunting does. It can't be manipulated. It's not manufactured. It's not on your terms. It's a lot like snowboarding other than the gear. Yeah. You need gear to snowboard. You need gear to hunt. But, you know, you got to hike up that mountain. If that avi fucking blows, you're done. Yeah. Right? You got to watch the conditions, you, you know. So, for me, that's my been my passion is hunting in the act of doing it. And the p- payoff is clean, lean meat. Yeah. Um, and there is nothing else that is on that level um that can is so pure to me yeah so you get in a state of flow obviously because you've got to be in the present moment you can't be out for sure i about- mean you know you got to be the right wind you got to you know watch out for the predators you've got to you know all sorts of stuff you got to watch the sun and the wind and the rain and the lunar charts and um it's completely you know one minute you think you're on it and the next minute you're not and then all of a sudden an opportunity happens you know yeah. and then you know, once you get a, you know, 800 pound elk down, you better know what to fucking do. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It ain't easy packing out 125 pound quarters, right? especially by yourself, you know? And so right. I, I crave more of the real experiences that are, you know, that can't be manipulated these days. Yeah. Yeah. When you contrast that to the manufactured experience of like a Coke high. Yeah, or like, you know, just, Molly yeah. going to a festival, which I've gone to festivals, sure, you know, sure. I've seen Bass Nectar and, yeah, you know, yeah, I've yeah, gone yeah, and yeah. seen some amazing shows and, oh, man, I've been on, you know, private planes with Peter and, and going to the MOBO Awards in the UK watching Tina Turner at a private show. Like yeah. I've seen some shit yeah. and it's been amazing. All of it's been amazing, but yeah. nothing compares to, for me, fatherhood and or um, being out in nature. Yeah, that's it. That's why I like, you know, I think now I look about it, my later part of, of snowboarding, even after my snowboarding career, there's nothing like hiking up to a peak, dropping in in a chute, doing those big wavy turns and <laughs> yeah. having snow fly all over you. <laughs> and I grew up in Big Bear Lake in a park. So, yeah, 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 you know. yeah, yeah. Oh, right. so fun. Travis, thank you so much for inviting me to your home. Hey, man, and, appreciate and, it. And bringing the goods, dude. This for has sure. been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. And I uh, appreciate you uh, putting all the effort into making this podcast and all the podcasts. Enjoyed a lot of them. And I uh, loved nice. hearing Vile's take on it from a different <laughs> perspective of form because, 
you know, we didn't talk about that kind of stuff and loved hearing the thing about Jamie and even Eastone. Like Eastone's been one of my buddies forever. So it's really cool to have this format to get to know uh, more about stories and people that you've known for a long time and, and, and their take and their perspective. So thank you for it's doing so that. It's so fun for me. Like that's, yeah. this is my flow. This is my hunting. I'm hunting you. There you go. <laughs> Appreciate right. it. Thanks. F and Rad shout outs this week to Travis and his son. Thanks you guys for letting us into your home. And thanks to all you listeners who've subscribed to our YouTube channel. It's building slowly but surely. So thanks very much. Thanks for listening to the end. And be sure to come back next week for another episode of the F and Rad Snowboard Podcast presented by Vans and brought to you by SIA Productions.